Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 14th session, the second last session of the RQI 2020 2021 online. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's invited speaker, Professor Adrian Kent from the University of Cambridge. Uh, Adrian is going to tell us about quantum information processing in space time. Uh, Adrian, uh, whenever you want, floor is yours. I'll give you a five minute warning after 25 minutes. Perfect. Sorry, after 25, did you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 30 yeah. minutes, but, but you can bite into the question time if you need to. It's just so uh, okay. Okay. No, that's good. Well, thanks very much, um, Eduardo and Rick, uh, for the invitation and for organizing this, this great series of great series of meetings or one big meeting, however you want to uh, think about it. Um, thanks to everybody for coming along. So I'm going to talk about a way of thinking about quantum information in space time that's getting more attention, but probably isn't, isn't familiar to everybody here. Um, I'll try and I'll try and give you at least a sense of the flavor of it, um, both in terms of the theory and in terms of uh, practical applications. I, I'm really happy to take take questions, um, dive more deeply into one or two things if uh, people are interested. So do feel free to interrupt to, at any time. So this really starts from this ta uh, thinking about quantum information in terms of tasks, and if, and one particular task um, that. I uh, came to my mind some years ago now, um, so-called summoning uh, a quantum state. And there's a, there's a sort of backstory here that you need to keep in mind for the rest of the seminar. So let's, let's go through this carefully. We've got not two people, Alice, involved, but two agencies. So Alice, the agency Alice, has a team of agents anywhere they need to be in space-time, um, as dense as you like. Uh, they're all working together, they can communicate, they trust each other, they can create joint algorithms. And then there's a separate team, Bob's team, another dense network of agents. They all work together, uh, but, but the Alice agents and the Bob agents won't help each other out. The task is defined between them, but it's up to, and in fact, it's a task that Bob sets for, for, for Alice. Um, but it's up to Alice to work out a way of satisfying the task if she can. And the task is a very simple one. Bob makes a random pure state, let's call it psi, um, some number of qubits, Alice knows how many. Bob knows what he's made, he? so he keeps a classical description, but he keeps that secret. Alice is given the state at some definite point, so one of Bob's agents gives it to one of Alice's agents, at some point P, um, and she's just got a, an unknown quantum state at that point. And in the simplest version of this task, he, she knows that it will be asked for, she'll be asked to return it, it will be summonsed uh, by one of Bob's agents somewhere, uh, and it's got to have to be the cause of future of P, otherwise it's pointless because there's no way she can send it outside the future like kind of P. And when it's summoned, she's, supposed to return it, as, as in her local agent is supposed to return it to Bob's local agent. And if you think about that for even a couple of minutes, you realize that without any further constraints, Alice, Alice is, has a losing proposition here. She can't in general um, comply with the summons request because if you look at this diagram here, she's given the state of P, she could be asked for it back at some point Q0, she could be asked to be back at some space-like separated point Q1. So the, these arrows with question marks are supposed to indicate request for the state. This is Bob saying, can I have my state back here, please? And she, if, if she knew she had to get it to Q0 in advance, of course she could do that, and similarly Q1. But if she doesn't know which, she can't have the state in both places. To be able to do that, she'd have to be able to clone it, and we know that's impossible with quantum information. Um, nor could she get it to one place and then send it to the other one if she finds out it's at the wrong place, because that would mean sending information faster than light. Uh, and a little more thought uh, will persuade you that although there are other things she could try, she can sort of split up the state into components and send them in um, different ways. Nothing she can do um, gives her a way of guaranteeing that she can satisfy the, 
task. So that's it's really just a one line thing. Um, that's the so-called no summoning theorem. And notice here, um, I actually made life as almost as easy as possible for Alice. We've just got two possible summons points rather than in the infinitely many of the like. But even so, um, the task is not generally possible. So this was taken further in a very nice paper by uh, Patrick Caden and Alex May a few years ago. Uh, they started looking at constrained versions of summoning tasks. Uh, and the, the picture here is now we've got a start point where the state is handed over and points where it's going to be requested, these are the black ones in this diagram, Y0 and Y1. Uh, could be many points, but here, here there is two. But the twist here now is for each request point, Alice doesn't have to return the state instantaneously or instantaneously up to eps epsilonics, but she has to return it at, for, for each call point, she has to re return it at some associated return point, which is in its causal future. So if she's asked for it at Y0, she's got to return it at Z0. Asked for it at Y1, she's got to return it at Z1, and in general, so on. So there could be many call and return points. And let, let's be clear on the precise details of the task here. Alice knows in advance where all the call points are and where all the return points are. Um, she knows in their version of the task that she'll only be asked for it once. So she'll get a summons at precisely one call point, and, and then she's got to return it at the corresponding return point. Uh, she doesn't know which one. She can have agents at the relevant spatial locations. So she can have an agent here at this X co coordinate and here at this X coordinate. And I should say, by the way, I, it's easier to write diagrams in one plus one D, but we should be thinking about this in uh, three plus one D. So she, anyway, she can have agents at all the relevant spatial locations um, ready in case of someone comes in, but she's got to work out what she can do with the state in order to be able to comply with the summons and whether, whether there is some algorithm that will guarantee that she can comply. So the picture is like this, Psi is handed over at S, Alice has her agents wherever she thinks they may be useful. And then the call comes in at some point Y3 in this, this example. Bob says, give me Psi back. And if Alice is successful, she's able to hand it back at the corresponding return point Z3. And the beautiful and rather unexpected result is that there are very tight necessary and sufficient conditions on when when summoning is possible in the in the sense of Alice being having an algorithm that guarantees that she will be able to respond appropriately to a summons wherever it comes so it's possible even only if well two things that you think you think obviously have to be the case every reveal point has to be in the future like kind of the starting point because she's got to get the state from the starting point to potentially any one of the reveal points. So that has to be true. Um, and the causal diamonds defined by the each pair of start and return points are causally related, meaning that there's a, a causal path from um, one diamond to the other, at least in, in at least one direction. That doesn't mean that there's a causal path through all the causal diamonds. Um, and that's why the theorem is interesting. Um, there are the interesting cases of where the task is not, not obviously impossible, but nor is it obviously possible. So for instance, there's a very nice simple example that Hayden and May gave in their paper. We've got a start point, which could be way back in the past. We've got three call points, the, the black points, the Ys, and three return points, the blue points, the Zs. And this is set up so that all these diagonal lines are light like. Uh, so the black lines connect each call point to the corresponding return point, like this. But there's also a light like path connecting one other call point to each of the return points. So you if you think about a naive strategy in which Alice takes the state 
and sends it to one of the call points, say Y2. Well, if she gets the call at Y2, she can send it on to Z2 and she's satisfied the task. If she doesn't get the call at Y2, her only other option is to send it to Z1. And that, that could work if the call came in at Y1, but she doesn't know whether it came in at Y1 or at Y0. And if it came in at Y0, then she's failed. And in fact, if it came in at Y0 and she had the state at Y2, there's nothing she could do. She, there's no way that she, she could get the state to Z0, even if she knew at Y2 that the call had come in at Y0. So there isn't an obvious strategy, but there is a strategy which relies on quantum secret sharing. Uh, she split, or quantum error correction, if you want to think about it that way. She splits the state into three components with the property that each pair, each pair of components suffices to reconstruct the state. And she sends the three components to the three possible call points. And then she does the only thing that she really sensibly can. Um, if you've got a component at Y2 and you get a call at Y2, you better send the state to, to Z2 because at least you've got a component of it there. Uh, if you don't get a call at Y2, the only other place it could be useful is Z1, so you send it there. And if you look at the diagram, what that means is that wherever the call comes in, say Y1, two components of, of the three will get to Z1. And if it comes in at Y1, there will be one component from Y1 and another one from Y2. And because secret sharing allows the state to be reconstructed from any two, uh, the task is satisfied. Okay, good. Um, still not at all obvious that um, every, let me, let me just rewind for a minute. Um, every situation covered by the theorem um, allows the task to be satisfied. Uh, I, and I haven't got time to go through the argument, but I, the spirit of it is you just need a combination of quantum teleportation, quantum secret sharing, and a, an iterative algorithm that breaks the task down into subtasks, into sub subtasks, and so on. And beautifully, it all fits together to show that whenever, whenever there isn't a knockdown argument that says this is clearly impossible, it in fact turns out to be possible. It may need a lot of resources, um, but it's doable. Okay, so there's um, a lot of other interesting tasks uh, related to summoning and uh, beyond summoning. And I want to touch on a couple of others. Here's, here's a natural generalization of summoning in which Alice gets information and it, um, it can even be classical information. So let, let's stick with that. She gets integers in, in a given range that arrive at various different space-time points. And those that collectively, that set of integers code for the place where she's supposed to return the state. So the state she's received some way in the past off the bottom of this diagram, more information comes in and she needs in principle, all of these integers, all the MI in order to work out where she gets the state, but she doesn't know them until, until she, they arrive at the points PI. And there is the unique return point that they code for. She's supposed to return the state there. So it's interesting to get conditions on when that is possible. And it turns out, well, that, um, you can at least prove some uh, if and only if conditions. In particular, you could prove that if the classical version of this task is possible, it, if she can at this point say, I know that it was this point and only this point, uh, and so I'm going to give you here a unique token um, to sh certify that I've got it to the right point, then it's also quantumly possible and the other way around. And the proofs of that, well, there's a constructive algorithm uh, one way around. If it's classically possible, you can build a quantum algorithm using the same sort of uh, tricks that Hayden may use. Um, and the other way around, there's an emulation argument. If there's a quantum algorithm, you can find a classical emulation of the quantum algorithm that does the same thing. If I had time, I'll come back to an application of this theorem, but I wanted to talk about another beautiful, fairly recent result, which again starts 
by thinking about the general class of quantum tasks. So a general set of quantum tasks, you, you have inputs at some collection of points. These red arrows are inputs at points PI. And there are outputs that depend in some prescribed way on the inputs. Um, uh, and these are the green arrows at points Q, Q. You could think of these as classical and or quantum. Um, we might as well go to a sort of Everettian view for this purpose. So you could um, think of them as purely quantum without losing any of the spirit of this. And what we'd like to understand in general is what, what features of a task make it possible or impossible. So that's a rather large question, uh, but there, there are surprisingly strong results um, that constrain the possibility. Uh, uh, I think there are reasons to be optimistic that we might get a, something like a complete taxonomy of what quantum tasks in space-time are possible and what are impossible. And in particular, um, there's a very nice paper from 2019 by Kafir Dolev um, on the possibility, or in his language, the doability of relativistic quantum tasks, which I just want to just want to summarize the results of here. So let's let's think. We've got we've got another one of these pictures in which you've got inputs. These, these are coded in blue on this picture, which I've taken straight from his paper. Uh, we've got outputs. So the red outputs are supposed to depend on the inputs, and they're supposed to happen at some points here. And in this picture, we've got some definite circuit set up in space-time that processes the inputs and produces some sort of intermediate states, which contribute towards the output. So here, for instance, two inputs are producing the required output um, at this red point on the left, and they're producing some other uh, intermediate state, which is combined with another state from over here to produce the required output here. So if you have a circuit to implement a quantum task in space-time, by definition, the task is possible. You've given an explicit way of achieving the task. Uh, the intriguing thing is that the details of the circuit matter much, much less than you think. Uh, so there are two very strong results here um, proved, in, proved in the paper I just mentioned. One is that the possibility of the task doesn't depend on, the, on fine details of the locations of the input and output points. It depends only on the co their causal relations. So. And what do I mean by that? I mean, for each given input point, what is the set of output points that are in its causal future? So if this one has these two in its causal future. This one has these two, this one, um, these two on the right again, and this one also these two on the right. And I can move the input or output points around in the diagram uh, as much as I like, as long as I don't change those causal relations, so as long as I don't take some output point out of the causal future of an input point that it was previously in the causal future of. The second, even more surprising result is, if a task is possible, then it's always possible without setting up any, interme any intermediate information processing. You don't need these green gates. Uh, you could do it just by communicating between the input and the output points and using pre-distributed entanglement, maybe a huge amount of pre-distributed entanglement, but that's all you need. So like, like the um, Hayden-May theorem, um, this should not be obvious. It isn't at all obvious, uh, uh, but it is, it's very powerful. It's also physically intriguing. It's, um, it's a sort of task-based version of the holographic principle in the sense that every physical system can be simulated. So if you think of a physical system enclosed in some volume in space-time, and then think of some surface that's outside that volume but surrounds it, any physical system can be perfectly simulated by devices on the surface around it. What? I'm sorry about the sort of 
crudity of this diagram. Um, but why do, why, what do I, why do I say that? Well, think, think about what's happening when you're probing a physical system. So here we've got something like a, a gem and you might fire laser light at it from various directions. And you might have a very complicated algorithm that fires lots of different pulses from different angles at different times and relies on a great deal of internal scattering inside the gem um, and processes all the outputs, collecting those carefully and lots of, from lots of different directions, again, at lots of different times. But in the end, if you think about it, yeah, atom by atom, what's happening is that a, lit, um, a photon is hitting an atom um, and moving the atom around, but deflecting itself. You've got, you've got basically a, a physical array of gates or something that you can mimic by a physical array of, of gates. And what we really have here is an input output circuit, maybe a very complicated one, but still, um, that's all it is. And the theorem I just uh, quoted tells you that you can dispense with the gates. You can do everything just with the inputs and the outputs. In other words, if somebody wants to spoof the gem, if somebody wants to persuade you you've got a gem when actually um, there's nothing there, they could set up spoofing devices, uh, sharing entanglement, and program them, and, and they need to set them up perhaps next to every input, so in the path of every laser beam, and next to every output, so just in front of the lens of every detector. Uh, and they need to program them appropriately to simulate the gem. But in principle, it's doable. No, nothing in reality is absolutely trustworthy. Um, and that's, I rather like that uh, sort of cryptographic glass on this theorem. Okay, so I have rather little time, I think, uh, to talk about more practical applications. Um, I'll, I'll just um, introduce the idea. Uh, so I've been working with um, my colleagues here on a form of quantum, uh, think of it as a version of money or token, secure tokens with quantum security, but a version that doesn't require, unlike traditional quantum money, any form of quantum state storage, quantum memories. And Uh, so, um, this starts from the realization that when you think about a network with relativistic signaling constraints, and the global financial system is certainly one of those, there are features of, that you would like for anything that um, plays the role of money uh, that aren't, aren't available from traditional money. So one thing you would like is, is maximal flexibility in responding to incoming data. You want, you want to be able to do something like satisfying a summoning task because you want to know um, how to get your money to the best possible place given market data that's um, maybe arising at different space-like separated points around the world. So you want something like summonability. If it's a time critical application, you want instant verifiability. So you want to be able to hand over your money and have the bank instantly accept it. Um, the bank wants a guarantee against double spending, so it wants to be sure that if you hand over the money here, you're not also handing over something that looks like the money at some space-like separated point and getting two sets of resources where you're only allowed one. And you want, you want privacy. Um, the bank shouldn't know in advance what, that you're about to present the money. It shouldn't know anything about your trading strategy or what you're doing with it. Uh, but, uh, all of those things. All of those things should be guaranteed by some protocol. So, as I, uh, as I said on the previous slide, generalized summoning tasks, you can also think of as uh, financially motivated things. They define trading strategies on a financial network where um, relativistic signaling constraints are important. And the key, the first key realization is, and if you think about it, this has always been true about money. Money money is something that has the properties of money. Well, that's sort of tautologists. Um, but the, pro the properties or the desirable properties of money depend on the context and the relativistic context gives you a new set of properties. And money, you need to reconceptualize what you mean by money in a relativistic context. Money is 
definable as something that is summonable, gives you instant verifiability, precludes double spending, and gives, gives privacy to the user. And notice that well, user privacy um, makes sense non-relativistically, but the first three of these things don't really even make sense, or, um, or at least they're uh, trivially sat satisfiable in, insofar as they do make sense in a non-relativistic setting. So this really, yeah. uh, relativity really does change our concept of money. It changes what we want from money. Five minute warning, Adrian. Five minute warning. Okay, you know, I, I don't want to eat up questions if there are questions. Uh, I could say more about traditional quantum money and our money and um, the advantages and disadvantages of each, uh, if people are curious. But I, I've just given you a taste of there. So let, let me just stop and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are questions. If not, if not, I'll say a bit more about money. But it's it's five minute warning from your time. There will be plenty of type of questions after. So I, I wouldn't worry. Oh, I see. OK. OK. Well, then you have 10 minutes of questions, dedicated yeah. to questions afterwards. Okay. So five minutes of your talk. <laughs> I, I, okay, thanks. Um, if there isn't a question instantly, I'll carry on for, for the remaining five minutes then. Thank you. Okay, so as people are probably familiar, um, the, the, the idea of quantum money goes back a long way. It was there in the first paper on quantum cryptography. Uh, and Wiesner's vision of quantum money was something like this, that you have a banknote with a serial number um, and some sort of quantum memory. Um, uh, so this was a theory, theoretical idea, of course. So a set of quantum states um, or one large, one complicated quantum state stored on the banknote. And the idea is that the bank has a record of the serial numbers and the quantum states. The user can see the serial number, of course, but they don't know what the quantum states are. And the, if the user presents a banknote, then the bank checks that the quantum states correspond to the record by carrying out the appropriate measurements um, and looking after looking at the serial number. So the bank can verify the validity of a banknote, but the user can't duplicate it essentially because essentially because of the no cloning theorem, although actually you, you need to do rather more work than that in order to get a full security proof. So if you think about the advantages of Wiesner's quantum money, um, in a relativistic context, it's summonable. Well, it's certainly summonable to the extent that um, uh, it can respond to any possible quantum summoning task, because the serial number can be sent everywhere, and the quantum state, uh, well, the quantum state can can be put into a quantum summoning algorithm. It's instantly verifiable if the bank shares with the bank's agents. Uh, the details of all the banknote serial numbers of the states, so that's good. It precludes double spending, as I said, essentially because of the no cloning theorem. Um, and it gives user privacy because the user, the user can privately send the quantum states along secure channels and the, and the bank has no, no idea what the user's doing. So as long as the user has secure classical quantum communication, their privacy is guaranteed. So the is Quantum money scores actually pretty well on these criteria. And uh, something which I think hadn't been realized, certainly I have, haven't seen it uh, discussed anywhere previously, uh, is that these quantum money really, uh, really is perfectly designed for relativistic networks and has all, all the advantages it gives are advantages that make sense in relativistic networks um, and aren't really necessary in, in a non-relativistic context. So that it wasn't thought of as a, contribution to relativistic quantum cryptography. With hindsight, um, I would say it really should have been. The drawbacks, the main drawbacks um, are technolo technological. Uh, quantum memories are very difficult things to maintain. Um, and although I'm sure the technology will continue to improve, it may, they may always be rather costly. Uh, Quantum summoning is theoretically possible. We've, I described these algorithms. I didn't go into details, but they they require a lot of entanglement. So there's a there's, there, there's a lot of resources um, that need to be used in order to satisfy even a reasonably simple summoning task. Also, we believe. 
And there's a question mark about whether you might be a, you might be able to find interesting schemes that can solve problems that can't be solved by quantum summoning. That, yeah, I, I'll leave that as an open question here. There is more to say about that. Okay, um, an alternative, so-called S money, where S, S really stands for summonable, um, uh, or if you're in an optimistic mood, super, as in better than. Um, so the alternative is to, use, is to set up schemes by pre-agreed rules that use only short-range quantum communication, but guarantee the security um, from, from the properties of the um, short-range information exchanges and from the protocol. Uh, using relativistic bit commitment protocols. This is much more practical because we can do short range quantum communication if, uh, and we could do it at multiple points, multiple nodes. You just need something like a QKD source and, and detectors at each, each point. So it's, it's not even expensive. Uh, and uh, well, then the, there are, you, need, you need to put together an algorithm that explains how you can replicate um, all the features of quantum money, uh, given that that can be done, um, but I'm not gonna go into that here. And it, um, it's based on bit commitment. In fact, it's based on something slightly weaker than bit commitment. So that at the gut, in the guts of this, um, all one really needs is something like a single photon source or an approximation to that um, from the bank's end uh, at every node where this communication is taking place. And then beam splitters and adjustable wave plates um, and, and ideally uh, efficient single photon detectors um, for the user. Uh, something like this. So here's a photograph of um, uh, the first pilot implementation of uh, these things using using off the shelf equipment from the Bristol group that was um, designed for handheld quantum key distribution. Okay. Um, I think I've probably used up my five minutes um, and maybe a bit more now. So I I'm happy to take any questions uh, uh, on, on any of this. Thanks very much for your attention. All right, then. Thank you, Adrian. Well, we open now the floor for questions. As usual, please uh, use the, the raise hand feature uh, on Zoom so we can see you. Okay, well, I don't see any questions yet. I have a question of my own. Um, so in, in, in terms of uh, uh, using um, quantum money and this implementation of quantum money, uh, so technologically, what was necessary, you need to keep coherence right all over the place. So this, it would be challenging, I assume, no? to, uh, to be able to use this in practice. If you, if you talk about Wiesner's quantum money, um, yes, you, um, you need, you know, you, you might be issued the money and not want to use it for quite a while. So you need long-term state storage. But if you also need, uh, if you want the flexibility, um, you need something like near perfect teleportation, right. which is technologically extremely challenging. And you need near perfect gates that are tunable to, um, to implement the secret sharing, the rest of the algorithm. See, so I mean, these are all interesting technological challenges and we're all hopeful that eventually there will be a quantum internet um, with enough error correction that all of these, all of these things are available. Um, but they're not there yet, and uh, by any by any means, and, uh, I, I'm not the best person to ask. But I'd be surprised if they're there for a decade. Um, uh, for, uh. So, so, so an, an, another question that comes to mind is uh, um, so so yeah, we have uh, uh, no cloning there, so fundamental principle. But I wonder how robust this is to. Um, you know, cloning with some fidelity, right? If you allow yourself to have an epsilon fidelity, uh, one minus epsilon fidelity, right? Can you still fool? Yeah. Uh, how easy it is, how robust it is? I know if you good, very good question, yeah. Um, yes, um, everything is robust against approximate cloning. Oh. Um, uh, certainly, in, certainly the way you phrased it, the one minus epsilon uh, cloning. Uh, and, be, and the full security proof of quantum money, for instance, um, 
which Scott Aronson and other people were involved in, uh, doesn't just look at uh, trying to perfect cloning, but at the possibility of any sort of information processing in which the quantum information could be split up into a, an arbitrary number of sort of weak, weak clones with little bits of information about the state. So you, you, you do need to go through those details and worry about them, but uh, they can all be handled. Uh, I mean, it, 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 is, it is totally robust. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thanks, thank, thanks very much. Uh, um, if people are sort of a little baffled but intrigued, I'm very happy to discuss offline later. Sounds great. Cheers. Thank you very much for the great talk, Adrian. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm going to pause the recording. All right. Our next speaker is Jose Polo Gomez. He's a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, and he's going to talk about a, a detector based measurement theory for QFT. Jose, whenever you want, floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo. Good morning, everybody. So today I wanted to talk about uh, how we can build a measurement theory for QFT using particle detectors. The content of the talk is based on work still in preparation done in, in collaboration with Luis Garay and Eduardo Martin Martinez. So here's the structure of my talk. First, uh, I will contextualize her work talking about the measurement problem in QFT. After that, I will present the setup I will work, I will work with. Then I will describe the measurement scheme and I will obtain the updated state of the field after the measurement is performed. Then I will show that the non-selective update respects causality. And finally, I will give a consistent update rule and uh, I will put together our results with previous results in order to hopefully convince you that uh, what we have here is a consistent measurement framework for QFT. So first of all, why do we need a measurement theory? Well, in any physical theory, we need to be able to describe measurements because we need to know how we can gather information from the systems we are describing. We need to know how, how, to, how, how, how to describe our experiments. Uh, in classical theories, the description of measurements is hidden under the assumption that we can operate on systems neglecting how we affect them. However, in quantum mechanics, that not, that's not true anymore. And describing measurements from first principle has been an issue since it's very beginnings and it's still an open problem. But in practice, we model our measurements using projective measurements and we update the state of our systems using Luder's rule, AKA the projection postulate. But can we do that in QFT? Well, as most of you already know, that is not the case. In 1983, Sorkin pointed out using a setup like the one you see in the picture that projective measurements allow faster than light signaling. Therefore, we are forced to conclude that even though they did the work in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we cannot use them to model measurements in QFT anymore because they violate relativistic causality and therefore they are inconsistent with the very foundations of QFT. So it seems we are in necessity of a measurement framework for QFT, meaning that we need a way of describing how we measure a quantum field. But what should we require from a measurement framework? Well, first of all, when we perform a measurement, we get a, a specific number that we can write down and we, we need our measurement theory to account for that. We need it to produce definite values. We also need an update rule that tells us how, how the system is left after the measurement is performed. This update rule eliminates the necessity of describing all the interactions that take place uh, in the measurement from a fundamental level, uh, which is something that we may not want to or we may not be able to do. Then we need it to be consistent with the theory that describes the system we are willing to measure. And finally, of course, we need to reproduce actual experiments. We need it to, to, to reproduce the way we measure in, in reality. So the necessity of a measurement framework has been addressed mainly in three ways. First, what could, one could say, well, measure, um, the, the Sorkin's problem, the, the, source of, the source of Sorkin's problem is that he uses a one rank projector. And we know that in general, finite rank projectors in QFT are not local. So let's use local projections. And indeed that was, uh, that's what Helwig and Cross already did in the seventies, way before Sorkin's paper was published. And they even give a, a covariant update rule in which the, the update of the state only takes place out of the causal support of the causal past of the, of the measurements. However, this has two problems. First of all, it doesn't really eliminate the Sorkin's problem, the Sorkin problem because 
because as Borstein, you and Kels um, revisited in the, recent, uh, in the recent paper, we can still, with a setup like this one, uh, allow faster than light signaling. And the second problem is that uh, they don't really represent uh, real experiments because uh, to the best of my knowledge, we do not know any measurement whose effect on the field is a local projection. So it seems that we need to, to, to use a different approach. So one option is to say, well, if we want our measurement framework to be consistent with quantum field theory, let's formulate it within quantum field theory. And that's precisely the case of the fuster Birch framework, which is beautifully formulated in the language of algebraic quantum field theory, and it's fully relativistic and perfectly safe from any inconsistency issues. However, the problem is that being formulated within quantum field theory, the probe they use, uh, we use the, uh, in that framework to measure the quantum field we're interested in is another quantum field. And the thing is that our real measurement apparatuses are usually, well, atoms, photodetectors, ice, and they are bound systems. And in general, we don't have a satisfactory way of describing bound systems within quantum field theory. So we could argue that this framework being perfectly valid is, um, well, is difficult to apply to real experimental setups. So another, options, another option is to model our measurement apparatus uh, with particle detectors that are localized non-relativistic quantum systems that are coupled to the quantum field we want to measure in some way, for example, linearly, like in the case of the unruh weight model. And for the unruh weight model, it has been shown that the, that the, the, the coupling can be made covariantly and that the joint evolution of the detector and the field is perfectly, uh, respects, uh, perfect, is perfectly compatible with causality. One could still argue that being non-relativistic approximations, um, in the case of the smear detectors, they allow faster than light signaling, pretty much in the same way that it happened with local projections. Uh, a detector and two detectors A and C can communicate so, superluminally using an ancillary third detector in between. However, it has been shown in this, uh, in this paper by, by Jose Ramon and collaborators that this part of faster than light signaling does not show up at leading orders in, in perturbation theory, and perhaps even more importantly, that the causality violation is bounded by the size of the, of the third detector. And we have already said that the, the, the detectors are non-relativistic systems, which means that at least you know, frame, in, in our, in our frame, for, frame of reference, we are neglecting its size when it comes to relativistic, to relativistic issues. So it seems that this faster than light signal is not something we should worry a lot about. And moreover, detectors are interesting for a very good reason. And it's that being, and that is that we can describe them using non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we know how to measure. That is using PBMs. So the question is, we have seen that PBMs cannot be applied directly to quantum fields. But can we apply to detectors, even though they are coupled to quantum fields? And that's precisely the question we are about to answer. In order to answer that question, we are going to consider arguably the simplest setup we can. That is a real scalar, scalar field in a flat space time coupled to a two level under the weight detector that moreover is stationary so, we, so that we can identify its proper time to be the coordinate time of the Minkowski frame in which we are quantizing the field. So there you have the interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture where chi, uh, where chi of t is the switching function that we assume to be compact so that we assume that the interaction is switched on at some point and switched off afterwards. Uh, f of x is the smearing function of the detector, phi is the field operator, and mu is the monopole operator of the detector where g is the ground state, e is the excited state, and omega is the energy gap of the detector as usual. So how is the measurement? Well, first of all, it is reasonable to assume that initially the state of the detector and the, 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 initially the, the detector and the field are uncorrelated. And in particular, for the sake of simplicity, we assume that the state of the detector is, is pure. <clears throat> of course, the results can be immediately generalized to the case in which it's a mixed state. So the measurement starts when the, when the interaction is switched on and the detector and the field start interacting and evo jointly evolve unitarily. After a finite interval, we assume that the interaction is switched off and the updated state of the joint detector and field system is given by rho prime there. Afterwards, a projective measurement is performed on the detector as promised, and this is the updated state of the joint field and detector system. It is important to stress that the measurement is the whole process, is the interaction, and is the, the interaction that allows us 
that allows the detector to get information from the quantum field. And it's the projective measurement that allows us to get the information from the detector. However, the detector and the field eventually become decoupled and we definitely do not want the detector to be part of the description of the field way after the measurement has taken place. So we should only be, we should only be aware of the detector of the state of the field after the measurement. In order to get, to get the, the update for it, we just trace over the detector and not very surprisingly, the PVM on the detector induces a POVM on the field, just as, it's, as it happened in the case of uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. In particular, for P being a projection over the pure state of the detector S, we get this update of the state of the field, where Psi, if you remember, it was the, was the, the initial pure state of the detector. The operator M is given in this form, where the integral sums uh, over kappa and kappa prime are just a way of uh, representing the identity of the Hilbert space of the field. And the normalization factor is given by this expectation value of this operator E that is just M dagger M and, and it's called the element of the POVM. In particular, notice that this expectation value is the probability of getting the outcome associated to, to, to S uh, when we perform the, the projective measurement. So now that we have the update, we want to check that this update is consistent with causality. In order to do that, we are only um, we, we should only be concerned about, about non-selective measurements. But why is that? And what's what's the difference between a non-selective and a selective measurement anyway? A non-selective measurement is one in which we are aware of the measurement being performed, but we do not know or we don't take into account the outcome. <clears throat> so the updated state is therefore a mixture of the updates associated to the possible outcomes weighed by the probabilities of those outcomes. In selective measurements, on the other hand, we know that the measurement is performed and we update the state taking into account, into account the outcome. However, consider that we have an observer that is space-like separated from our, from our measurement, from our detector. In that case, that, that observer may be aware that we are performing the, the measurement because we may have agreed upon that beforehand, but for sure, they are not going to be aware of the, um, of the outcome. So if they are going to, to update the state of the, of the field, they have to do it at most in a non-selective way. And that's why we only care about non-selective measurements when it comes to checking if causality is violated or not. In order to check that, in order to carry out that analysis, we, just, we, we are going to compare the endpoint function of the updated state in the case of a non-selective measurement and the initial state of the field. So first of all, notice that since the detector is a two level system, we only have to take into account two possible outcomes associated to states S and R that are orthogonal and, and form a basis, a basis of, the, of the Hilbert space of the detector. Now the updated state of the field is given by this expression. And if, rem if you remember the probability of S and the probability of R are precisely the normalization factors here. So that in the end, we can write the updated state for the non-selective measurement like this. And in particular, because S and R form a basis of the detector, of the Hilbert space of the detector, we can ultimately write this updated state as a trace over the detector of this operator that is of the joint system formed by the detector and the field. So that if we want to calculate the expectation value of some operator of the field A, we can express this as a, as a trace over the whole detector and field system. And in the end, we see that if A is taken to be the product of uh, M field operators of associated to points outside the causal support of the detector, then this operator is going to commute with you because you remember was the time of uh, the time order ex, uh, a time order exponential of an integral of the interaction Hamiltonian. And interaction Hamiltonian only involves um, field operators that are associated to the points inside the interaction region. So that because of microcausality this thing is going to commute with this, with this thing. So that we can take this unitary operator to, uh, next to the U dagger and get the identity and check that indeed the, the, M for, the, the endpoint function uh, does not change between the updated state and the initial state. In fact, we can apply this very same argument to any operator A, any local observable that has its support outside the causal uh, support of the detector because for the same reason it is going to commute with you and therefore we are okay, five, five minutes. Okay, what we see, and therefore what we see is that uh, the expectation values of local observables outside the causal support of the detector are not affected by our non-selective um, update. That means that our PVM on the detector 
does not allow faster than night signaling. And in particular, it is not an impossible measurement. So now that we see that our, 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 our measurement scheme is, is consistent with causality and with, uh, with relativity, we are in a good position to prescribe an update rule for the state of the field. <clears throat> now, if we analyze selective measurements, we see that if we were to apply the update outside the causal future of the detector, indeed, we would observe that there are, there are modifications of detectation values and that's, that's expected because there, are, there, there is, in general, there is entanglement in the field. So if we want to give an update rule that is causal, um, it is not, we, we can't aim to give an update rule that, that is global. Instead, we have to give up to some extent on the physical significance of the density operator, uh, of the state of the field as a density operator, and give an update rule that is observer dependent. And in particular depends on the information available to that observer. So the update rule would be as, as follows. After a measurement, if an observer performs a projective measurement on the detector, they have to apply the selective or the non-selective update rule, uh, the, in, depending on whether their measurement was selective or non-selective, only in their future. And it's not that we do not update or we update the, the state of the field outside the, the causal super. It's that we do not care at all what happens there because we are defining, we are considering the density operator to be defined only along the history of a, of a certain observer. Moreover, what we, sh what we showed about non-selective measurement um, tells us that the, 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 the update rule is consistent, and in particular that space-like operations do not affect each, affect each other, as, as is desirable in a relativistic theory. And finally, for consistency, we have to, as, as the update rule depends on the information available to the observer, we have to say that if an observer comes across another one that shares information with, uh, with them, then they have to update their state Using the, same update, uh, using the same update rule according to that information. Um, in particular, this last uh, prescription gives us a way of, of actually checking that the, the update rule is consistent. In the sense that, well, consider for example, that two, two observers A and B perform projective measurements in space-like, uh, well, sorry, perform measurements with detectors in space-like separated regions and eventually they meet each other and share their outcomes. Well, consistency in this case means that once they meet, uh, they, they meet each other, they have the same information about the, about the, um, the measurement that have, been, that have been performed and therefore their updates have to, have to be the same. And indeed, that's, and indeed that's, that's what happens because we can show that because A and B are space-like separated, their associated M operators commute. And indeed, what we get is that the update rule for the updated state for A is the same that the updated state for, for B after they share the same information. And in particular, that same commutation allows us to write this equation here that can be read as the probability of getting B, given that we have obtained A, is equal to the probability of getting A and B divided by, prob by the probability of getting A. And that's precisely the equation of, uh, of conditional probability. So it tells us that our update rule indeed accounts for the correlations. So finally, let's go back to the beginning. We have presented a measurement framework. Does it mm, fulfills all the conditions we, we, wanted, uh, we wanted it to? So first, it, it, it produces definite values. It does, because we have used projective measurements on the detectors and that gives us a definite value. It gives us an, it gives us an update rule, we, we just did. It is consistent with the theory. For this, we need two parts. We first need to check that the interaction part is consistent with the theory. And for that, we have these uh, papers. The first one tells us that, that we can formulate the, the, the coupling covariantly. And the second one tells us that the, causal evolu that the evolution of the detector and the field is indeed causal. It respects causality. And moreover, that we can control the, fast, the faster than light signaling events. And for the second part, we have to show that the projective measurement of the detector is consistent with the theory. And that's precisely what we have done in this work. And finally, um, it has to reproduce experiments. And indeed it does, because it has been shown that the unruh the weight model is a good approximation, it uh, reproduces uh, well uh, light matter interactions whenever there is no exchange of angular momentum involved. So we have arrived at the, at the end of the talk. Um, in this talk, we have uh, obtained first the POBM update rule for the state of the field 
as we did to the PBM performed on the on the Unruh Lewitt detector, we have shown that this PBM does not allow fast analyzed signaling, and therefore our measurement our measurement scheme is is consistent with the quantum field theory. And finally, we have given based on those results a consistent observer dependent update rule for the state of the field that completes our, our measurement framework for, for QSP. And well, before saying thank you, I just wanted to clarify that, that uh, these, the, the results of this work, uh, in case you're interested, will be on archive in the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. All right, so we open the floor for questions now. As usual, please use the raise hand feature. Oh, yeah. Max uh, has a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. You. It was really nice, really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, I have a question concerning um, uh, the, the, the statement you made. I think you said that uh, the measurement um, is not an impossible measurement that you described there. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, I understand that together with um, the result of uh, Jose and company um, before that, um, you have to be careful that the that the that the size of the um, of the space time regions are not too big um, in a sense that you could run into into the same Sorkin impossible measurement problem with the three agents. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it allows faster than light signaling pretty much in the same way the interaction itself allows faster than light signaling. But again, mm, I kind of argued that since we are neglecting the size of the detector, that's uh, an assumable uh, faster than light signaling. But, but yeah, sure, of course. Uh, what, I'm, what I mean is that is it does not allow faster than light signaling in the way PBMs on the fields does. That is an uncontrollable faster than light signaling. But of course, uh, in in pretty much the same way, for, uh, local projection local projections do and local operations in general do, um, and and the unruly weight itself with its interactions uh, with its interaction allows, yeah, in this kind of measurement it does allow faster than light signaling, yeah, in, in, with a with a with a third. I mean, if, if here B performs a projective measurement, it, it allows faster than light signaling. But it, we don't we don't even need the the projective measurement just yes, because there is an unruly weight and there is interaction there. We are already allowing faster analyzing signaling. But what I'm arguing is that it's, it's controlled. It's to some extent. I mean, in, within the range of approximation that we are considering, it's assumable. I that makes sense, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Right. Thank you for the great question, Max. Any more questions? All right, Alex, uh, yeah, whenever you want. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Very, very interesting topic. And I, I'm not sure if you understood why you said that the state of the field and of the detector are separated after the measurement. No, I, well, I didn't say they are separated. I mean, um, they, the, the, after we make the, the measurement of the detector, we are, um, <clears throat> We are going to have a separated state of the of the detector because we have projected it already. But in any case, what I mean is that after we decouple um, the detector and the and the field and we perform the measurement, we do not want to have the detector into account uh, for describing the field ever. Um, I mean, after the measurement has taken place, so that's why we trace over the detector. But anyway, yes, uh, after projecting over the state of the detector. The, the oh, oh, sorry, after, after performing the projective measurement on the detector, the state of the detector is going to be the pure state associated to that, to that projection. And therefore, what we are going to have is indeed a, a separated state. Yeah. Okay, because I, I am wondering if we, if we have, could have a time scale for this to happen. You know, a time in, in which the, the detector is not entangled with the, the field anymore or something like that. Oh no, I mean, it's uh, in general, after the interaction is going to be entangled with the field, of course. Um, and it's uh, what, what I mean is that when we perform the projective measurement on the detector, then after that, we do not want to take the detector into account anymore. And we're going to have a separated 
um, as a project state. I don't know if I understood your question right. So if, no, if, I, if I may say something, that, that, so, so imagine right, uh, you, you, the detector couples to the field and gets correlated with the field through the interaction, entangled in particular. And then the PVM press on the detector, you can think of it as, okay, now we extract a classical number from the detector and make a measurement and we measure whatever you want, the monopole moment, and you get a one. And then all that you are left with is the data. The detector is no longer coupled to the field. We assume the coupling was on and off. So the detector is no longer affecting the state of the field. What you do is update the state of the field with the information you obtain from the detector. So you consume those correlations. And now you want to talk about the state of the field after knowing that. That is the POV and that's what the POVM is doing for you. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just uh, wondering if you, we could have a, a minimum time for the measurement to occur. If, oh. if you need so some time, because we have vacuum fluctuations that can become very large for uh, a small time or something like that. I mean, um, the, 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 so what, what you're asking is about how long the interaction, not, not, the, measure, not the predictive measurement, but the interaction can be. Yes, yes. how small the, the time of the interaction can be so to perform the, the, the measurement. Um, I mean, it can be, it, it can be arbitrarily small, but, but we have to do the switching uh, carefully. That's, that's what I, I, I would say in order for the, the um, yeah, for not having any divergences. And, but in general, that kind of depends on the switching function. It's not, it's not going to condition. Yeah, I don't think it's going to condition the measurement at all. Well, well it, it depends to what kind of detector, right? The detector is finite size. If it's a point light detector, you have to have enough time to do a switching on that doesn't destroy your system. Yeah, you are switching on that is smooth enough and switching off that is smooth enough. If it's a mere detector, there are time scales that don't make sense. Uh, you cannot use a detector model wow. uh, for times that are shorter than the light crossing time of the detector. Yeah, sure. That would be stupid from the relativistic point of view. So that limits the applicability of the model, right? Mm -hmm. An atom ca ca cannot, cannot tell about the field that is measuring in times that are less than what it takes for the nuclei, right? To, <laughs> to see that there's electrons in there. <laughs> So yeah, there are limits, of course, of applicability of the model. But I think what Posse says, the model itself is not limited. You can yeah. do whatever switching you want, right? Yeah, I mean, from just looking at the mathematics, it's, it's not, that's for sure, I mean, from a practical point of view, there are limitations. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Very cool, Alex, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, thanks for the question. Oh, Max, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, hi, sorry. Um, since this, uh, this slide is up at the moment, um, I, I wanted to know what, uh, what exactly you mean by produce definite values. Well, I mean that after the measurement is performed, uh, we have to be able to get from our measurement uh, a number that we can write down. That's the way measurements are done in, in reality. We do not get like an state. We, we get a number and that's precisely what we achieve by doing the projective measurement on the detector. I, I do not see how this is tied to the fact that you're using a projective measurement on the detector. Oh. And couldn't I also claim that I, I mean, how I update the state, well, whether I update it with um, PVMs or POVMs or so should not affect the fact that what I get, what I read off of my, I don't know, measurement device, the pointer value or so is a certain value plus minus error bars. Well, I think it's, it is uh, tied to the, um, to the fact that we are doing a predictive measurement because that's the way, I mean, for example, imagine we only consider the interaction of the field and the detector. In that case, what we get, what, what we get, what we get afterwards is a, a particular state of the detector that we, we want to access. But in order to access that, to get the definite value, we, we need, I mean, the, the way in quantum mechanics we get definite values is with PVMs. We could do maybe a measurement of the, uh, a measurement, well, we could, we could make the, the detector interact with another detector and make the PVM on the, on the other detector so that the update in the, in the first detector would be a POVM. But in the end, we need to do a PVM. In, in the end of the chain, we need to do a PVM that is the way in quantum mechanics, in our relativistic quantum mechanics, we get definite values. Uh, Eduardo is a... No, oh, no, 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 that's not a good answer. I would say that, uh, so that the condition maybe has to be read as, as, it needs to have the ability to produce definite values. 
you could do a weaker measurement on your detector for sure that's not forbidden but at the very least i should have a way to measure like a stronger lag kind of measurements okay i know that is plus one half or minus one half at the very least has to have the ability of so yeah, it's not that it pro prohibits weaker measurements on the detector of course you can have weaker measurements in the detector yes mm -hmm. I, I mean of course, but weaker measurements will be, yeah, would be like more useful in the case if we want to perform some protocols or, but in the, like in the actual measurement, the way we measure, we kind of need to extract the information from the detector ultimately using that kind of measurement, right? I, I definitely agree that, that in, in the end, what, what you want is, is an outcome of, of the measurement. It's just that I'm not entirely sure that this is tied to the fact that you then uh, update with PVMs and not POVMs generally. But I, I definitely get that, uh, of course, we want, well, we want to predict definite values because that's what we measure. Mm -hmm. I mean, POVMs are perfectly allowed to us. I, as I told you, we could update the detector also applying a POVM, but the, the reason why POVM makes sense as an update rule is that what we are doing, what it's behind the, P, the POVM is that we are performing a PVM on, a, on, a, on, a, on something that is interacting with our system. So updating the, the detector with a POVM means basically that we are putting our detector in, to interact with another detector and we are, or, or something, another, mes another measurement apparatus, and we are performing the PVM on the other apparatus. So it's, it's just, yeah, of course, I mean, I could do a, PV, a POVM on the detector, but in the end, that means the same, it's just, uh, prolongating the, the change of apparatuses that we are using to ultimately get everything because you know there is such a chain in, in reality because when we perform a measurement we are making we are making the, the system interact with an apparatus and after even afterwards we are seeing the, the outcome of the measurement with our eyes so that's kind of also a POVM in the end. Uh, there's a change of detectors and we need to perform the PVM at some point. Uh, at least that's the model we have in normal relativity. Quantum mechanics, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I've been talking, saying thank you very much for the great question, but I was muted. Sorry about that. Uh, there's another question from uh, Dan. Go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to add something to what Jose just said. Um, the, the reason it has to end in a PVM is because the end state of the experimental apparatus has to be measurable repeatedly. You look at it and you see a one, and then you look again and you see a one. Repeated applications of POVMs uh, will alternate between measurement states. Like our, our end result of our measurement state is always in a definite thing where we look at it and it doesn't change. Um, so th this is why the measurement chain has to end in a PVM. It's the origin of the of the Luther's rule, indeed. It's, it's, it's kind of the, the Luther's rule tells, tells us a way of updating the state of the system in a way that is consistent. That if we look at it as Dan perfectly said, we would look it again, we get the same result, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I don't know if Max has comment. I see some oscillations of the head. That's typically a sign of, hmm. <laughs> if you do, please feel free. Thank you. No, um, I would just say that I think it, well, it, it can be argued whether the final um, state should be um, one that gives you the same value after repeated measurement, because you can also think of, of destructive measurements where afterwards, um, well, the, the system is gone. So um, there are things you can argue, but I definitely see your point. I, um, I, I, see, I see, and I know where the motivation comes from. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Okay, great discussion. Uh, if there are any more questions, let's thank Jose again. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you. Right, let me stop the recording. All right, our next speaker is Felix Spengler uh, from the University of Tübingen, and uh, he's going to talk about perspective of measuring gravitational effects of laser light and particle beams. Okay, floor is yours whenever you want. Uh, thank you, Eduardo, and thank you for the kind introduction, and also thank you for, for putting on this uh, very nice uh, conference on online that's been now running for I think three months. So uh, as Eduardo mentioned, I'll be talking about the perspectives of measuring the gravitational effects of laser light and particle beams. <clears throat> as is based on a recent article we pre-published on archive by me, uh, Dennis Retzel from Berlin and Daniel Brown, which is, who is also a professor at the University of Tübingen and is actually here right now. Okay, um, 
Now, if we want to measure the gravitational effects of laser pulses uh, and particle beams, we first have to talk about what the gravitational uh, perturbation coming from these sources is. Then we need to talk about uh, what we can use as a source of this kind of gravitational signal. And then we have to talk about possible detection mechanisms that could be employed to measure such a signal. And then hopefully in the results, uh, we can see that we could actually probe the general, general relativity in the laboratory with this kind of system, maybe in the near future with few adaptions uh, to existing experimental setups. Okay. So first, let's talk about the gravitational field of a laser pulse. A laser pulse we'll model in the simplest sense as a short box of energy flying from an emitter to an absorber here along the positive set direction. And we can model this in linearized gravity with uh, taking the metric uh, using some Minkowski background and then a small per perturbation H. Now in the right gauge, uh, we'll end up with a wave equation, equation for this uh, perturbation to the metric. And the source term in this wave equation will be the energy momentum tensor of our laser pulse. Now the energy momentum tensor of the laser pulse has, because it's uh, relativistic and has no rest mass, has uh, a structure similar to this one. So you have two diagonal elements and then two off-diagonal elements of the same uh, magnitude. And then uh, because this equation is linear, your perturbation to the metric will also look like this. Now the full result is a bit complicated, but uh, limiting ourselves to the case very close to the laser beam, we have the following result that we get a perturbation to the metric that is uh, logarithmic in the distance from the beamline rho, and that this uh, perturbation is only there within the light cone of the emission event. Okay, um, now we have to extend this to uh, a laser pulse oscillating back and forth between two mirrors such that we get a reoccurring periodic gravitational signal. Um, so uh, here on the right, you see the space-time diagram of this uh, laser pulse oscillating back and forth. And uh, we can treat this case very uh, much the same way as the laser pulse before. We once again have linearized uh, gravity and have this small perturbation, which we now have to split into two parts one for pulses propagating along the positive uh, z direction and one for pulses propagating in the opposite direction. Um, they'll have two different structures thanks to the opposite sign of the momentum, but it's uh, again very similar. Now, uh, once again, the result is very uh, fairly complicated, but uh, in the limit very close to the beam, so in near field limit, we have a similar result to before that we get again in the light cones of the reflection events now, uh, we get a logarithmic dependence of our metric perturbation. And then uh, if we put ourselves in the point of view of a non-relativistic test particle such that we have low velocity, only the uh, top left component of these tensors matter. And we can approximate this with an effective Newtonian potential that is given here, which is again logarithmic in the distance from the beamline and has a, has a prefactor, the pulse power and some constants. Okay, now we have the effective Newtonian potential uh, and can look at what we could use as a source of this uh, potential. Uh, the first source uh, we will consider is the one that was basically the, the reason for this it is laser pulses oscillating between two mirrors. And this could be modeled by a laser pulse in a cavity. Now there is a bit of a problem with coupling this laser pulse into the cavity as uh, short pulses are not monochromatic. So it's uh, difficult to couple uh, this into the cavity. 
but still it is possible and it is done in enhancement cavities where they can uh, improve the average power in the cavity by a factor 1000 over the power of the pumping uh, laser that is uh, emitting these pulses. The obvious uh, advantage of pulses is that we have a very high pulse power, but uh, the pulses are often very short, such that the average power is uh, fairly low, especially when compared to CW lasers. Uh, another limitation which you always have in cavities is the intensity threshold. You cannot cross uh, without melting the mirrors, but this can be circumvented by uh, increasing cavity size, increasing the spot size uh, of the laser on the mirrors and uh, should not pose a problem. Okay, so if this is not enough power for you, then as I said, uh, CW lasers offer more power. And also it's easier to couple a CW laser into a cavity. But uh, CW laser is of course a bit of a different source uh, for the gravity wise. This is no longer a pulse traveling back and forth, but rather now there's a standing wave inside the cavity with some energy distribution. Uh, and that is, has now also an attractive force. Interestingly, the Newtonian potential for this is the same as the effective Newtonian potential for the pulses propagating back and forth. And uh, this is now true. While there is uh, power in the cavity, you have this effective Newtonian potential rather than before where we had the potential that was there while we were in the emission cones of, uh, in the light cones of the reflection events. We now have a much higher power, uh, average power. But one possible problem is the slow buildup time of the power inside the cavity. If you have a very high finesse, it will take a long time to fill the cavity with uh, high energies. And then it will also take quite a long time for the energy to, to decay again. But this can again be circumvented by using shorter cavities where the decay rates will be greater. Okay. If this still isn't enough power for you as a source, and of course we want the source with the most possible power to create a signal we can detect, we can consider a high energy particle beam, such as the one at LHC. Now uh, in the relativistic limit, these particle beams are equivalent to the uh, laser beam as the, the rest mass is uh, small compared to the energy of the particle and also charge and spin in this limit become irrelevant. And so we have the same uh, effective Newtonian potential, which we can use for uh, our uh, calculation. The LHC has a much higher average power than uh, a CW laser, but it is limited in frequency range. range. Uh, there's a limit given by the rate, uh, the frequency which one particle has uh, to takes to go around the circular ring. Um, and this is 11 kilohertz. But to go to lower frequencies, we could modulate, for example, the position of the beam, such that for half of uh, the oscillation period of the sensor, it will be close to the sensor. And for the other half, it will be distant. And uh, this way, we could reach lower frequencies. And it will, would be much like uh, in the case of the CW laser in the cavity. Now, let me give you some numbers on what these types of sources could produce. As I said before, the CW, uh, CW laser has a lower pulse power than the pulsed lasers, as you can see here, but the average power is uh, greater than for the pulsed laser. Here we considered some uh, very strong commercially available lasers and made an estimation. The LHD beam is in all regards better than uh, the laser sources uh, and provides by far the highest possible average power and also the pulse power is very high. The beam waste you see at the bottom is the closest distance you could in theory get to the beam. Uh, and the LHC beam once again is uh, can be much more concentrated than uh, the laser beams for these very high powered lasers. Okay, now what 
can we use as a detector? The first model we wanted to consider is a simple uh, deformable rod, which is essentially a Weber bar. And in this one, uh, we want to have a standing sound wave by this periodic gravitational signal. And to model this, we have to take the sound wave equation, which here for the displacement field is given by this wave equation. Uh, for you, the displacement field, and on the right, we have as a source term the, the acceleration or rather the force given by the effective Newtonian potential. Now, what we get when we take the uh, boundary conditions is the ground mode uh, I tried to illustrate in blue on the right. And uh, what we then have to do is then project our uh, effective force driving the system onto the ground mode, which you see here on the right. This is the projection, uh, the Fourier component, uh, the spatial Fourier component with respect to this effective uh, force that the rod is feeling. And then uh, in front of that, you see the temporal Fourier uh, component corresponding to the temporal mode uh, of this ground mode. Uh, in a rod like this, with realistic materials, you could achieve quality factors in the mega, uh, in the million to 100 million range. And we want to consider two uh, fairly extreme examples. One is a very short rod, which would be given uh, by this one gigahertz frequency case. And one is a fairly long rod, a meter long rod, given by this kilohertz case. Uh, the truth probably somewhere in the middle, but these cases will give us a feeling of what frequencies will be preferable. Now, if this system doesn't uh, do it, then we could go to higher quality factors. And one way to do that is to use a detector that was recently proposed by Singh et al, which is this uh, superfluid helium contained in a superconducting cell of NIO, which they use as a gravitational wave detector. Uh, the, the helium itself has a very high quality factor and uh, is therefore preferable uh, over the rod I talked about before. Now, essentially, this is also a deformable medium such that we can also have a standing sound wave uh, as before, but now the boundary conditions are different uh, because we have two fixed ends at both sides of the cylinder and as the ground mode, we will now have this uh, sine function. But otherwise, the derivation is the same. And uh, we can still calculate an expected resonant amplitude with respect to this ground mode by projecting onto this uh, ground mode our effective uh, force uh, the, from the three considered sources. Another aspect is that helium in its liquid form has a very low speed of sound compared to uh, materials like aluminum, which we considered for the rod, such that uh, for a frequency in the kilohertz range, we will, we will have a cell of centimeter length, which uh, would be much more reasonable than the meter long case of the rod before for uh, an even lower frequency. OK, the, the third possible detector we want to consider is this uh, high quality pendulum, uh, which was recently uh, submitted in article, uh, talked about in articles by Matsumoto et al. They fabricated a pendulum from uh, one block of silica. Uh, it is a fairly small pendulum, it's a milligram mass, which is then suspended uh, along this uh, silica monolithic uh, string essentially and is very tiny. The pendulum itself has a very high quality factor and it was measured to have uh, the quality factor of two times 10 to the six at uh, an eigenfrequency of 2.2 Hertz. Now the special thing about this pendulum, of course the, the quality factor is already great, but it, the special thing is that the frequency can now be modulating uh, by adapting the, the stiffness uh, with an optical spring. Now the, then the frequency of the system will shift to a frequency omega zero, but also the, the quality factor has a very uh, fortunate scaling by going with uh, 
quadratic with this new frequency and increasing to a much higher effective quality factor. Then uh, also the effective temperature of the systems uh, system will be reduced by this quality factor, which will also, of course, benefit the noise. Now we don't have an extended system with a standing sound wave uh, as uh, for the two systems we considered before, but now we just have the gravitational acceleration by our uh, passing light pulses, which is given by this. Uh, and then we have to project onto the modes of the pendulum. Okay, now let me show you some numbers. For the three detectors uh, you see at the top that we considered, uh, we combine them with all three possible uh, sources and uh, then gave the, the resonant amplitude uh, for this detector uh, combined with the, one of the sources. Fix, uh, five minute warning. Thank you. Uh, for the rod, you see that, uh, of course, the rod is very far away from the sensitivity, which we calculated using uh, quantum noise and thermal noise uh, combined version of them. Uh, and you're many orders of magnitude away. In the kilohertz case, you are uh, much closer, but still way too far to uh, reach this uh, uh, to be able to measure this amplitude with the given sensitivity within integration times of let's say one year. In the liquid helium case, you see that you are in the case of the strongest source, the LHC beam, uh, seven orders of magnitude away, which is uh, means that after an integration time of one year, you would be three and a half orders of magnitude away, which sounds almost reasonable, but still is too far to be able to detect this. Now for the pendulum, you're actually very close. Uh, for the LHC beam, you would be only uh, roughly three and a half orders of magnitude away from the sensitivity such that after one year of measurement time, uh, you should be able to measure the amplitude created by the LHC beam in this pendulum. One problem that I uh, didn't mention yet is that uh, all of these amplitudes are resonant amplitudes which means essentially that it uh, takes a long time of driving this uh, with our gravitational source, uh, as for example, the LHC beam, uh, to reach this resonant amplitude. Now, um, especially for the high quality factors uh, and low frequencies, this means that uh, it will take many years essentially to reach this resonant amplitude. Now, uh, we wanted to improve upon this by essentially constructing a, a pendulum where we limited the experiment to one week, which means that for the amplitude to build up and also for the measurement, we allotted a time of one week and then try to optimize the pendulum setup, which was already the best in our previous considerations uh, and wanted to optimize it uh, for this one week of experiment time. We assumed a bit smaller distance to the beam by essentially uh, uh, expecting that the pendulum could be optimized in its shape uh, to get closer to the beam than uh, we considered before. And uh, limited the mass to a still reasonable 33 milligrams, which is a uh, factor five uh, higher than compared to the, the one that already exists. Now you plug all of these numbers in, you take the quantum noise, you take the thermal noise, which are in this combined form uh, included down here. And then uh, you have this uh, reduction in your amplitude by the slow uh, bounded buildup of the amplitude with your quality factor and frequency given by this term in front. And then you get this uh, equation which you can optimize over the different parameters. Here, the measurement time, the ground, uh, the mechanical frequency, and the shifted uh, optical spring frequency, and the quality factor. Now, uh, for a short optimization, we found uh, a signal to noise ratio almost of order one with some very reasonable values, uh, a low mechanical frequency slightly lower than the one used before uh, the 
optical spring frequency is now also uh, slightly lower than before, but still all reasonable. And even the quality factor seems to be uh, within reach. Uh, on the right, you see plotted this function optimized that, that was optimized. But uh, the good news is that we are almost there. And with some further improvements, for example, we could consider even stronger sources, such as the soon to be uh, hopefully realized high luminosity upgrade of the LHC, which should give, give an, another factor 10 uh, to the power, and some higher density materials, which would mean uh, higher, uh, higher mass pendulums, and also then, of course, lower noise and a better signal to noise ratio we would able to get uh, beyond the signal to noise ratio of one and hopefully uh, soon might be able to actually uh, measure the gravitational signal produced by, in this case, a particle beam. Uh, so by a lab scale source um, with almost uh, a small improvements upon the existing technology. Um, also, this might open paths into uh, experiments on quantum gravitational uh, signals in the sense that the sources considered here could also uh, be treated in a quantum mechanical way. Thank you. Yeah, sorry again, I was talking, being muted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the great talk. Right, uh, time for questions. I see that there's, oh, there was a hand by Dan Daniel Grimmer. Was that a, was that a question? Sorry, I was looking for the applause button. Ah, I see, I see, okay. All right, so please, if there are any questions, uh, use the raise hand feature. Okay, Albert Roda. Albert, whenever you want. Yes, thank you, very interesting talk. Uh, so I had the impression that um, so one of the interesting aspects of this is that uh, this would be a different source of gravitational field uh, being a relativistic one uh, compared to the, the other sources of, of gravitational fields that we are used to measuring. So I guess that's maybe one of the motivations for, among others, you also mentioned others maybe at the end of your talk. But the question I had was that the, so far the strategy, the, the measurement strategy, strategies that you presented here as if I understood correctly, focused on the non-relativistic part of the metric, so to speak, on the on the time-like component of the metric, right? Yes. So my question is, could one also think of uh, alternative measurement strategies that were also sensitive to the components of the metric where you have a difference between the relativistic and non-relativistic sources? And in particular, I'm thinking of maybe something like a kind of Michelson interferometer where one of the arms is parallel and very close to your beam. And uh, you try to do uh, then an experiment a little bit similar to what is done with, you know, LIGO or anything. Some Michelson interferometer that is sensitive to small changes of gravitational field. Uh, yes, this is actually a, a good question. Uh, the problem is, of course, that to access these uh, components of your metric that are uh, like off diagonal or any other component than essentially the zero zero component, you need some relativistic detector as well. So a right. laser- the photons, the photons with a laser interferometer are- ex right? Exactly. So uh, there, there are some papers by uh, some colleagues actually on the effects of a laser parts like this on a co-propagating or counter-propagating uh, laser beam. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are some effects such as uh, phase shifts and stuff like that. And but those are of course a lot smaller in the sense that the, the rest mass uh, the, or the equivalent rest mass equivalent to your beam in the Michelson interferometer will be very small. So uh, the effects will be also a lot smaller than the effects we considered here. I see. Somehow, well, I guess one, of course, needs to look at this in detail that maybe it was done in this paper, but somehow the, the intuition was that um, if, as I said, one needs to look at this in detail because probably some things cancel out, but it, it really depends on um, what is the 
change of these metric components that would be relevant if it's at the 10 to minus 20 level, for example, then uh, at that point, uh, if you think in terms of a Michelson interferometer similar to LIGO, it, it no longer matters what is the, I mean, maybe you can phrase it in, the, in terms of those, but uh, you don't really think in terms of that. You just say, how sensitive can I be to small changes of certain metric components, you know, with these uh, laser interferometers? And uh, of course, you know, with something like LIGO, you can really go for the appropriate components uh, to, you know, 10 to minus 22 and below. I understand that that's something that is acting coherently and adding up along these four kilometer arms. And uh, whereas here, this would be very different, I suppose. So, so that's where, why you would not be able to, to probably get that level of sensitivities. And of course, the other aspect is really what are the metric components that would be relevant in this case, how localized they would be. So maybe all that uh doesn't work but it just this intuition that the, the michelson interferometer is well i guess we agree on that it's in principle sensitive to some of these components that non-relativistic sources would not generate and we know that for certain cases you know like those of gravity long wavelength gravitational waves they can be very sensitive but it might be that when one looks at all the details in this setup that you are that you are considering for the sources it doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, it, it, it ends up being very far from, from, and that's maybe what you were hinting at. Yes, so, so the, the perturbations to the metric considered here are uh, even smaller than the 10 to the minus 22. So it's more on the order 10 to the minus 26, uh, if I remember correctly. The, the only reason, uh, so the advantage of the detectors considered here is that are, they are resonant and for a detector like the, the LIGO interferometer, you wouldn't have any uh, benefits like this. Oh, I see, I see. So I guess that, okay, you mentioned that point, but I see now how crucial it is. So you're saying that really the amplitude of these metric perturbations when properly phrased, it's, it's even substantially smaller than 10 to minus 22 or so, but you're really relying on the fact that here you have a really very periodic source and you rely a lot on this uh, resonant effect for this very rather narrow sort of uh, frequency band to enhance your uh, measurement signal, if I understand it correctly, you're, you're, you're saying that, right? Yes. I see, I see, okay, I see. So I, that I had maybe not fully appreciated from your talk, I see. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? All right, then, if there are any more questions, uh, let's thank Felix again. Felix, thank you very much. Thank you as well. All right, stopping the recording. All right, so our next speaker is Piotr Grotowski, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, quantum dilation in atomic spectra. Uh, Piotr, whenever you want, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as just Edo said, my name is Piotr, and I am a PhD student at the Center for Theoretical Physics of the Polish Academy of Sciences from Warsaw, Poland. And right now, right now I moved to ICFA Institute in Barcelona, Spain. And today I'm gonna tell you a bit about the phenomenon of the quantum time dilation. So, namely, what happens if you consider a clock to move in a superposition of two different velocities. So this talk is first of all based on the on this recently published paper in physical review research, and it is basically as like a logical continuation of a talk that was given by Alex Smith like two months ago, in which he provided like a theoretical basis on the of this quantum time dilation stuff, and I I'm gonna uh, focus more on the on the like a physical realization in the of this quantum time dilation in the atomic spectroscopy. So before I start, let me show you the faces. Let me show you the faces of the people that were involved in this project. So here's myself. Here is Alex, who is right now at St. Anselm's. So we have Andrzej Dragan and his PhD student Kasper Dembski, both from the University of Warsaw. So let me start with a short recap of this quantum time dilation stuff. So uh, so if you want to construct a theory in which you want to introduce a uh, observable of time basically in a like a covariant way. Uh, it naturally follows that you, you, your ideal clock in this theory is described by uh, some degrees of uh, degrees of freedom. So we have a center of mass motion of this of this uh, of this clock, 
some internal degrees of freedom that work as like this clicking mechanism of the clock. And there needs to be some coupling between them, between this center of mass and the internal degrees of internal degrees of freedom that are like responsible, responsible for the reproduction of the, let's say, special relativistic time dilation. And within such a theory, you can, you can think about what happens if you consider some clock, let's say A, to be in, in, in a superposition of, a, of a two different momenta, basically. In here, PA and PA prime. So this is like uh, and, uh, this diagram. So the big question to, that we want to ask, what is the average time that is measured by this superposed clock with respect to a condition on the clock, some other reference clock B? Uh, in here. So the answer is that on the average, we have like two contributions to the leading order. So we have like this classical part that reproduces the, let's say the average of the two different special relativistic time dilations coming from the fact that you have like this, these two different velocities, plus some non-trivial quantum correction to it, which we dub a quantum time dilation that comes from the fact that there is some coherence between these two, two wave packets. So uh, what, what, I, what we want to do, like it was all derived in the, uh, like with some ideal clock uh, uh, assumption. So we want to ask whether it's, it, was repro uh, it can be reproduced in a system that is more physical. So the starting point is like the simplest idea of the clock, which is just a decaying atom. So this, this just comes from the, straight from the, from the some any quantum optics book. So we have an atom that is like really well localized in some point of space. Uh, and it's at internal degrees of freedom are reduced only to two levels, uh, some excited state and some ground state. And uh, and it's initially uh, it's it is initially put excited and then due to some coupling to the quantized electromagnetic field, it decays to the ground state radiating some, some photons. And then from such a framework, we can like extract some obser observables like uh, population of an excited state as, as a function of time, uh, which gives us some, uh, some uh, time scale like uh, connected to the let's say, lifetime of this atom, of this excited state. And on, and, and on the other hand, we can look at the photons, we can look at the angular distribution of these photons, we can look at the probability of excitation as a function of the energy of photons getting the shape of the emission line, which is centered, uh, usually centered around the transition, like energy difference of these ground and excited states. So what is less common is to add the quantum degree of freedom of the center of mass motion of this atom. Uh, in, generally speaking, it's not an easy thing to do uh, because like, Starting from the basic, you need to consider a, like a composite system of consisting of two particles, two massive particles that have some charges that interact via Coulomb forces, then coupled to the electromagnetic field, and so on. So you can like perform the whole analysis, get some like really lengthy Hamiltonian with all of these terms in the following orders, like a, in the multipolar form. Uh, but then we want to ask a question: What's the good approximation? What will happen? about what will happen in the leading order in the experiment. So we know from the experiments, like the experiments with the atomic clocks, that, uh, that first of all, the special relativistic time dilation is observable in the sense that it's a leading order and like the experiments with moving atoms radiating on with, like in the situation of the simulated emission, uh, they obey the special relativistic time dilation. So this is one, well, this is, th this is the thing that we need to reproduce with our theory. So in here we have a Hamiltonian that is like up to the leading relativistic order that will reproduce. It. So let me let me show it. So we have a Hamiltonian that consists of the atomic part, uh, electromagnetic field part, and the coupling between them. So the field part is a standard one. So, but in a case of the atomic Hamiltonian, usually we would just have the internal degrees of freedom given by this projector uh, with this energy gap uh, large omega. But we additionally, uh, well, we add the center of mass motion plus the relativistic correction to it, plus the relativistic correction in the form more or less like a, like a time dilation to the inter internal degrees of freedom. Okay, and the coupling uh, between the atom and the field is a standard one in the sense it's within the dipole approximation. 
So we have like this really well-known dipole term consisting of the dipole, uh, dipole moment and the electromagnetic field. And with this less known term, which is called a Röntgen term, uh, which signify, just signifies the thing that uh, the field that is felt by a moving atom changes, like, like in the Lorentz force, basically. So this is just a well-behaved, well-symmetrized version of just the field transformation. So what we want to solve uh, is that we start, we just start with some initial state, but which is given by some, first of all, when it comes to the center of mass, it's just given by some uh, wave packet uh, given in a, in a momentum representation, plus the atom is excited and the vacuum field is of course in the vacuum uh, and the electromagnetic field is uh, in, in the vacuum state. So we just assume that it evolves according to the ansatz given in here. So we have like a superposition of the, uh, we have a superposition of the excited state plus the uh, de-excited atom uh, with some recoil plus one photon uh, that is emitted into the, in, uh, that excites the field, let's say. So we just solve uh, this like well set of the differential equation by the standard means of a, of a Laplace transform. And with this calculation, what we can get? We can get, first of all, a total transition rate, uh, meaning like how, how the whole atom decays. Then we can have an angular distribution of the emitted photons, which can be measured in the experiment. And we have uh, some shapes of the emission lines, as I uh, said before, like as a function of energy. So we will focus on what, on what happens if you consider the superposition of two different mo uh, momentum wave packets, like within the signatures that, that can be measured in the spectroscopic uh, experiments. Okay, so uh, to like to show you like exactly what we calculate. So we want to model this clock as in a, su in, a uh, in a superposition of two wave packets. So we do it like we just assume our atom, like which like, well, in our model is ser serves as a clock. It's in, in the superposition of uh, two Gaussian wave packets in the momentum space, one center at some P1 the, and the other center at P2. And both of these wave packets have the same, uh, the same spread given by delta in here. Additionally, we add some, uh, uh, some, uh, some relative phase between them. And the, well, the, the main point is that the, this is like, like a coherent superposition. We compare this case to the another case, which is a, uh, which, uh, which assumed like this atom to be in an incoherent classical mixture of this, either in this uh, P, like this wave packet P1 and this wave packet P2. And what we will do is we just compare these two scenarios to extract the difference which can be measurable in the experiment. Okay, so the first thing is the total transition rate. So if we can cal calculate this total transition rate, we'll get this kind of, uh, so, okay, one assumption. So we assume that our momentum wave packets are really well localized in the, let's say two out of three directions. So all the whole system, like the whole system, like when I say localized, I mean the localized around zero in the momentum space. So the whole system is basically quasi one dimensional one. So we like get rid of all, all of the vectors in here. So what we get, is that uh, is this equation which gives us a total transition rate? Uh, here is, we have a large gamma knot, which is just, just unaffected transition rate of an atom that is standing still and just emitting photons, plus some correction, which is as you can see quadratic in a, in a momentum, which is as could be expected from the special relativity. So to further conf confirm it, we just assume this psi of p to be some Gaussian wave packet centered like single peak Gaussian wave packet center around P naught. And we retrieve this formula, which would could be expected from an atom moving in like a, uh, moving in a like with a constant velocity, just radiating. So it recovers the special relativistic time dilation. So this is like a confirmation that at this level our our theory works. And then we would like to see what happens if we really consider like superposition versus the classical mixture. So we just subtract these total transition rates and see that we get this, this gamma Q, 
which was this exact, which is exactly this quantum time dilation term that came from this ideal clock uh, considerations. So basically we show that in our model, uh, we retrieve consideration coming from this ideal clock, which provides like a strong suggestion that this quantum time dilation might be universal phenomenon. So what we do uh, further, we like see what these quantum time dilation terms look like. Well, not to complete, like we have like a couple of free parameters to like to tweak, but not to complicate things. I'm just gonna show you how it depends on the relative phase between these two, two, uh, two wave packets. So, uh, uh, so here we have a picture, which like the, the color is the, just the, this amount of this, the, the magnitude of this quantum time dilation term. So here we have a difference in the momenta of these two wave packets. And on this vertical axis, we have a relative phase between them. As you can see, for every relative phase, there is some non-zero optimal momentum difference of this wave packet. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, basically what we did, we just like scanned through all of the parameter space and found what, what is the most optimal scenario in which this quantum time dilation can be observed. And well, like when, like in the following part of the talk, when I'll be talking about some like say experimental consideration, I will mean like utilizing these, uh, these best parameters. Okay, so that was the first bullet, let's say. The second one is an uh, angular distribution of thought. So we have three pictures. Uh, uh, so, uh, and in each of them, there is like two vectors. So D is just a direction of the dipole moment. P is this direction of motion. As I said, it's like we have a quasi one dimensional problem. And then a color and shape is just a magnitude. Like it's, uh, so if it's red, it means like there is like a positive correction. And if it's, it's blue, it's a negative one. So in the left, we have like a zero order term, which is, which is just a dipole pattern. So it does not depend on the direction of motion, just like how the usual st atom standing still decays. So if we, if we integrate it out, like uh, if we integrate the, like the, the angles out, then we'll see it just integrates to uh, gamma, not this uh, total transition rate. Then we have a linear correction, which is anti-symmetric, which is important because it means that it integrates to zero not giving this linear correction, as should be, as, as is expected from the fact that we only should have this in the, in the total transition rate, we should only have this quadratic correction. And as you can see from this quadratic correction in here, uh, we can see that if you want to measure this quadratic correction, the best, uh, the best direction to do so is perpendicular to the motion, because here are this, this part is the largest. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let me move to the third part, the shapes of emission lines. So in here, uh, we just integrate over all the angles and just uh, look, well, we don't integrate over the angles, sorry. We just look at the particular photons emitted from the, from the atom. So first of all, we look at the photons that are emitted, emitted parallelly, uh, parallel to the motion. Uh, so let us look for a second on this equation. This is a Lorentz curve, which is Usually, when we do not consider a motion, it's it's centered around the, this uh, transition uh, transition uh, this energy gap omega. In here, it is linearly shifted uh, due to the Doppler shift, as you can see in here. So this is just a Doppler shift, and as you can see, if we consider only a let's say one single peak Gaussian wave packet, it should like the, the the this emission line should be shifted according to this Doppler shift. And if you consider like a superposition of two of them, or like this classical mixture, there is a double peak structure. So uh, the okay, black, uh, five minute word. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, so the red curve is the superposition uh, case, and the blue one is the classical case. Let's say this classical mixture case. So uh, in both of these uh, frames, uh, like the the difference in the velocities is the same, is kept kept constant. The only thing that we change is the is, is the spread, this momentum spread of these wave packets. And as you can see, there's like the larger the spread, the bigger the difference between this classical and the superposition case. And this difference is analogous to the like this this well this difference is linear in the in the momentum, 
and it's only due to the like uh, quantum coherence between these wave packets. So uh, in this picture, what we see is Doppler shift. So in an in an analogous way to this quantum time dilation phenomenon, we dubbed it a quantum Doppler shift because it provides a quantum correction to like the usual Doppler shift. Okay, so, uh, but what about the quantum time dilation? So if we consider the photons that are emitted perpendicularly, the leading correction to this Lorentz curve is quadratic in the, in the momentum. So this curve, this, this peaked Gaussians, sorry, Lorentzians are shifted like according to the special relativistic time dilation. And this is exactly what we see in here. We have like the double peaked structure as it was in the case of this, uh, in this parallel photons. And there is, of course, a difference between this superposition and classical cases, uh, which is uh, which is a minus another manifestation, so a manifestation of a quantum of a quantum time dilation. So uh, the only well, the the other difference between those two cases is that for this uh, particular for these parallel photons, we use the because we put like a real experimental numbers in here. We, in here we chose the transition in a hydrogen, some transition in a hydrogen. And in here, uh, extremely narrow transition in, a, in a aluminum that is used in the like the state of the art atomic class. Uh, okay, so you may ask whether it's possible to observe this kind of phenomena in the in the experiments. So the answer is not yet, but there are some. So in order to observe this quantum tidal relation stuff, we need two building blocks basically. So first of all, we need to go into the precision that allows to measure the well, relativistic effects in the, like this relativistic shifts in the frequencies of the clocks. And it was done. It was already done like 10 years ago and it's like getting better and better. We are like currently we are like three orders of magnitude below the limit of the, uh, of the relativistic corrections. So, so it was it was usually done in the settings of the with ions in here aluminium in which they were put in the quadruple trap and like shift like 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 touched like like uh, well put out of the equilibrium and like causing the oscillatory motion and uh, the special relativistic time dilation followed from this experiment so this one is checked. The other ingredient would be a creation of the superposition of, let's say, station, let's say one stationary atom and the other like in oscillatory motion. So uh, such well, such coherent superpositions of uh, let's say coherent states like Schrodinger cut states have have, uh, uh, have also been done in the experiments uh, like a couple of years ago. So in order to observe this, let's say effects of the quant of the momentum coherence on this uh, on this spontaneous decay or like uh, or the stimulated emission or whatever or in general spectros spectroscopic experiments we would need to combine these two let's say these two state of the art experiments experimental settings so it has not been done but probably it can be done in the future because like the uh, the numbers work in our favor so of course this is not like the only case the only experimental settings that that we can like think of like we can go in the direction of like a experiments with like large momentum separation some maybe some analog ultra cold solid state settings some maybe some some radiation cavities and so on like there are like a couple of directions in which this 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 thing can be pursued okay so to sum up like there are like two main messages is that first of all that the quantum the time dilation has been shown in a, to occur in the like, physical setup, setup in an identical way as in the ideal clock model. And the other thing is that it might be achievable experimentally in some time, right? Because the, the building blocks are there. Uh, so we can take a look at our paper and thank you for the attention. All right, thank you very much, Piotr. All right, it's time for thank questions. Again, for it's open for questions. If you have a question, use the raise hand feature. Okay, Albert Rora. Yes, thank you. Uh, interesting talk. Um, so 
Um, I was trying to understand the, the effect that you're finding. I had the impression, and also the comparison with the case where you have an incoherence mixture. And I had the impression, maybe I, I, I misunderstood, but that uh, as if the effect was coming in a sense, or it could be interpreted as follows. You have this uh, superposition of these two wave packets that have a certain uh, width in momentum space, right? Yep. And I had the impression, but correct me if I, I misunderstood, that what seems to be playing an important role here is that uh, because of this spread in momentum space that they have, um, the, you, you have a superposition of two different central momenta, but it seems to me that maybe in an implicit way, but uh, what is important here is that you have some overlap between these two uh, momentum wave packets. And then for some of these momenta that overlap, which would correspond to these valley, well, in maybe these or some of the previous pictures, uh, in some sense, I could interpret that by saying that, look, if I think in terms of momentum space, uh, your distribution in of your of your the sum of the two wave packets really momentum space. I can think of components for every momentum uh, eigenstate, and then because of the overlap between the two wave packets that are part of your superposition, for some of these uh, momenta where you have an overlap, the amplitude there is not just given by you know. The incoherent sum, but really you have the superposition. But yeah. that's when you interpret the decomposition in Fourier space, if you want, of your uh, momentum eigenstate. And there you might have an interference that uh, will depend on phi that you can think of even at the level of when you prepare the initial state, so to speak, the superposition. And then you let it evolve. You have these effects that can be interpreted as, uh, you know, time dilation. And uh, and you know, for different momenta, you will have these different factors of p squared over mc squared. But in a sense, the interference was already, or could be interpreted as just saying that it was already in the preparation of your initial state. And as I said, it seems that it's crucial, but correct me if this is not, uh, if I misunderstood, that you have overlap between these two wave packets, right? This is exactly as you said. Like the crucial thing is that there is an over, like these, these two wave packets are not orthogonal. There, there needs to be some overlap between them. And it's like, it's crucial how we prepare the initial state. There needs to be some coherence. That's coherence between those two wave packets. And that's why I like said a couple of times that there's, there is like effect of momentum coherence in, in contrast to this like classical mixture. And of course, this is like big criticism because like when we call it like some new quantum correction, we would like to have like an orthogonal states and which provide some enhancement. And this is, of course, can be, this is like a way of extending this model to, let's say, a clock that consists of two atoms that are each prepared in the, like, the orthogonal wave packets with some entanglement between them. Then th it would be like a truly quantum enhancement in this case. This is right. like a, still a quantum thing, but it's due to a, like a really quantum coherence between in the momentum space. Exactly. But so exactly. So my comment was then the next step you just anticipated that is that an alternative where you avoid this issue as, as you just explained is that you could uh, create a superposition where the, the overlap, if you want, is negligible or will not play a role. Then they have different central momenta, but then to see the superposition, of course, you have to recombine them. So you have to modify their momenta and eventually, uh, so in the sense of a, an interferometer, these quantum clock interferometry experiments. Then it would be similar, part of it would be similar to what you have here, but where you would have the different central momenta, you have the superposition of your clock state, or you could do it with, with uh, atoms that are decaying as you did here, but it might be easier to implement experimentally by preparing a non-trivial superposition of the internal state, playing the role of your clock instead of just the decay of the atom. But then you create a superposition of these two different momenta, as you say, but then you, what you need to do, so they separate, the overlap is not important here, but then you eventually, you know, redirect the central momenta so that they can finally be recombined and read out the, inter the interference. So that's another strategy that- uh, yep. so, so, so basically I have a many body physicist and uh, like when, like this is like one atom. So like for me, the natural direction is to go for like many atom system. And then we can like think about all of, of all of the sort of 
a different extension, like the, as you said, like the entanglement between this internal degrees of freedom, entanglement between the, like the center of mass motion, like some mixture of, like this, like a really rich directions. There are like a big number of directions explore. And but, it would so what, what I was mentioning, you can still think in terms of single atoms, because it's really, uh, you know, at the bottom level, it's really a single atom that is in a position of basically following two different trajectories, like the two uh, twins yeah. in the same paradox that would experience different time dilations. And then the point is that it's really a single atom in a superposition of these two paths that experience different uh, time dilation, and then you recombine them and you read out that. And, and in a sense, also the, the entanglement between the, in this case, these two levels and the, and the center of mass motion, which is certainly one way of interpreting those, the, the outcome of those experiments, you also have that implicitly here because you have the internal structure of the atom that is decaying and that, you know, it's a two level system and so on. So there's a sense in which uh, there is also such an entanglement because in your Hamiltonian, you have these terms that are playing a role that couple the center of mass motion. Uh, so basically, and, basically uh, this is this term, like this is like where it makes sense. Right, right, right. And exactly, yes. I mean, I believe there was experiments in which they looked at the, at the correlation between the uh, the center of mass motion of the atoms that were already decayed and the emitted photons. So this is like a bit what you are just right now just saying, yeah. Yes, so there, 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 there are various uh, possibilities, but yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks, thank you. Thanks. Oops, all right, thank you, Albert. Great question, thank you, Piotr, great answer. Any more questions? Okay, if there aren't any more questions, let's thank Piotr again. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, our next speaker and the last speaker of the session is Andre Dragan. Uh, and uh, he's gonna talk about the quantum principle of relativity, Andre from the University of Warsaw. Andre, whenever you want, floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see so many friendly uh, avatars around. Uh, hopefully we can see each other in, in, in real, in real life soon. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, referring to famous figure from uh, Richard Feynman's textbook on uh, quantum mechanics. And he describes double slit experiment. And he says that basically this experiment reveals everything we need to know about quantum theory. All the fundamental postulates are sitting there. And he uh, lists them as, uh, first of all, you, you cannot predict the future if, um, in single experiments. Uh, the outcome of a single experiment is unpredictable. So reality is undeterministic. Second of all, if you let your system evolve freely and you don't interrupt it, and the system can evolve in two or more ways at the same time, uh, then it will take all the um, paths at the same time, so to speak, and uh, that's what we call quantum superposition. And uh, third of all, there is a rule for calculating probabilities of given outcomes, and that rule involves summing all possible alternatives for each alternative, there is a complex number, and uh, you have to sum the complex numbers, take a model square, and get the expression for probability. And these uh, um, postulates fall, like, fall out of the blue. Uh, this is the comment that Feynman makes. Uh, one might still ask, how does it work? What is the machinery behind the law? And no one has found any machinery behind the law. No one can explain any more than you have just explained. No one will give you any deeper representation of the situation. We have no ideas about the more basic mechanism from which these results can be deduced. All right, challenge accepted. Uh, uh, last year, we have published a paper uh, by me, I mean uh, myself and Arthur Eckert, who is most likely going to be future Nobel laureate for the discovery of the quantum um, cryptography. And we challenge that claim and we say that basically you can deduce all these things that I just mentioned from something really very simple and uh, even more surprisingly from uh, special relativity. So we wrote a paper in which we claim that you can actually deduce all these things, quantum unpredictability, superpositions and complex numbers from very simple relativistic arguments. Uh, the paper got like really uh, went viral. So it's one of the most read papers I think in physics last year. And uh, the first question is whether Einstein's rolling in his grave because he hated 
quantum mechanics and we claim that actually quantum mechanics is, is, is a consequence of relativity. But it turns out that he is not rolling in his grave. He's well and uh, alive and he is running a Twitter account in which he was actually sharing our, our paper. So uh, uh, he actually, actually he wasn't uh, so furious about it maybe. So let me, uh, I, have don't, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna just uh, use very simple um, observations to, just to tease about the, the results. But uh, let's, let's begin with very brief crash course on relativity. So uh, normally when you derive uh, equations for relativity, you start with assumptions that there is something called principle of relativity, which states that all inertial observers are equivalent, which makes you consider only linear transformations between uh, coordinate systems with coefficients depending on velocity, the goal of the derivation is to derive those coefficients. And uh, very simple uh, reasoning can already uh, lead you to, to believe that uh, the ratio of these co coefficients are given to minus velocity, relative velocity between the, between the frames. And when you consider not two, but three inertial observers, then you can actually show that the other coefficient A has to satisfy the following equation in which there exists some constant of unknown value such that this combination of the coefficient a must be equal to it. And historically speaking, we call that constant one of the c squared, one of the velocity of light squared. And actually that derivation immediately leads to something that we know as Lorentz transformations with k uh, equals c squared, one over c squared. And by the, by the way, this shows that you don't have to assume the constancy of the speed of light to derive relativity. You can actually uh, uh, take it as a as a consequence of, of your considerations. However, there is also um, a second branch of solutions that is allowed mathematically, at least, when you derive uh, 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 Lorentz transformation. And that second family of uh, solutions is given by these formulas, which are not, not so well known. And while the first family of solutions is only well-defined for velocities that are smaller than C, uh, the other branch of solutions is only well-defined for velocities that are larger than C. And uh, these superluminal solutions are normally discarded as unphysical because uh, they certainly lead to some so problems with causality uh, of various sorts. And uh, nobody has seen superluminal particles. So people basically don't like those solutions and uh, get rid of them. So in our work with Arthur, we have uh, uh, asked ourselves what happens if we don't take that extra assumption of neglecting those solutions. And if you just let them be and let them uh, um, be considered on equal footing, uh, then obviously we, ha we will have some problems with causality. And that is true. We do have problems with causality. However, what we have uh, realized is that those are not really paradoxes of any sort, but rather you get the exact deviations from causality that we know from quantum theory. So the claim is that if you take into account all mathematically allowed solutions to uh, like basically principle of, of, of relativity, uh, then what you end up with is that uh, reality which is non-deterministic, which has to have superpositions and which has to have complex numbers uh, in order to de describe um, physical uh, quantities. And uh, let me briefly uh, discuss some of those uh, features. So first of all, let us address the problem of, of, of paradoxes in, in superluminal objects. So let us consider a situation in which we have two observers or two, two, uh, two persons that exchange a superluminal bullet. And shoot a, one, one may shoot the, the gun and suppose we have superluminal bullets that leave at A and reach B and shoot him in, in the knee, for example. Then in a new frame of reference, you can always find another frame of reference in which the order of these events is reversed, which means there is always a subluminal frame of reference in which B is first and then there is A, which makes you uh, ask, okay, uh, does it make sense to consider situations in which the cause is first and the, sorry, the, 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 the result is first and the cause comes second? And uh, yes, of course, it's, it's, it sounds crazy and doesn't make, make much sense. And for that reason, uh, those superluminal objects are usually discarded as unphysical. But I would like to focus on this problem a little bit more and uh, observe some, there are some subtleties that may go unnoticed when you look at it first. So by saying that I'm shooting a gun with a superluminal bullet, I'm making two claims. First of all, that there exists bullets that can move superluminally. 
And second of all, that I can shoot them. I can pull the trigger and at a given instant, I'm gonna be able to emit a particle like this or a bullet like this on demand. Uh, so there must be some sort of mechanism uh, prior to event A, chemical process, maybe physical process uh, that controls the moment at which I'm shooting the bullet and I can control the process and pull the trigger at a given moment. Now, on the other side of the, of the story, there is B and B is hit by the bullet in the knee as we agreed on and he cannot predict that in advance. So there is no physical mechanism in the past of the event B in his word line locally here that would be able to predict the exact moment when he's going to be hit by the bullet. Uh, well, he's just an independent uh, observer, so he has nothing to do with the, with the gun. No, nothing surprising here. So the same should also apply in the second frame of reference. So uh, again, there is no local reason for the bullet to be emitted at B because in this frame of reference is the bullet that leaves B and goes towards A. And one could ask a question, where is the cause of the emission of the bullet in this frame of reference? And uh, one may say, okay, uh, in this crazy formulation, the reason for this is somewhere far away at A, possibly in the future. So such an event would be completely non-local. But what we can say with certainty is that if we only had access to local degrees of freedom, if, if you are looking at the bullets, at the, at the particle B and its past and its uh, environment, then there is no local and deterministic mode of description of this event. And to a local observer, this emission would have to look as completely spontaneous and unpredictable. Exactly like the photon being emitted from an atom. There is no local and deterministic theory that will be able to predict the exact moment at which a particle decays or a photon is emitted by an atom or, or something like that. So to a local observer, uh, this would look undeterministic. And that's the first conclusion. Uh, if you allow those particles in some frames of reference, you have to deal with undeterministic behavior. But then one can ask another question. In the first frame of reference, I had a perfectly deterministic description. In the second, I don't have such description. What's, what's the problem? And the problem is that in order to impose principle of relativity, which states that all frames of reference should be equivalent and there should be no preferred frame of reference, you cannot say these things that I just said. And in order to solve the problem, you would have to say that there could be no local and deterministic frame uh, description of the process in the first frame of reference. So, uh, so to say, if you want principle of relativity and local and deterministic description, you cannot have those three things at the same time. So the conclusion would be that if superluminal objects would have to exist, would, would exist, then uh, they would have to be always emitted in a spontaneous, unpredictable fashion with no local and deterministic theory that would allow to describe those processes. And as a consequence, if you have a source of superluminal particle and it only emits them spontaneously, you cannot use such source to send information. And therefore, uh, there is no clear paradox because paradoxically, uh, you could have superluminal particles, but you still would not be able to use them to communicate. So uh, whether there is a paradox or not is, is really unclear. And uh, one, we can then think whether it really makes sense to discard those particles from physics uh, a priori uh, based on some uh, causality arguments. So the first conclusion is that uh, if you allow those particles, you would inevitably end up in reality that is unpredictable. Uh, second of all, let us consider another photo experiment. Ah, well, uh, what about massive particles? Whether they can uh, decay in a deterministic way, uh, or uh, or they also have to share of share the fate of undeterministic superluminal objects. So, if you consider a process in, of decay of a massive particle into two massive particles, then let us ask ourselves how this process would look like from the perspective of the superluminally fast. Uh, observer. So let us transform this diagram into the frame of reference that moves with a superluminal velocity. In particular, we are allowed to consider um, infinitely fast moving observers. Now, uh, a little bit of math here. Um, while a regular Lorentz transformation is a hyperbolic rotation that basically uh, moves the axis close to each other, uh, time and space, 
the superluminal transformations are also hyperbolic rotations, but by the angle that is larger than 45 degrees, which means that basically you are essentially you are changing time and space with the rows. So if you look at the formulas, the infinitely fast moving observer corresponds to a transformation that flips time and space. And in that process, in the superluminal frame of reference, looks like the one that is rotated by 90 degrees. And in this frame, all the particles appear to be superluminal for that observer. And uh, actually, it looks like uh, there is a perfect symmetry between those two families of observers, superluminal and subluminal, at least in one plus one dimensional space time. And being superluminal becomes simply um, relative. And in the superluminal frame of reference, all those particles are superluminal or tachyons. And since we have already shown that uh, the case involving tachyons must be unpredictable, then for the same reason, if there is no local deterministic mode of description in this frame of reference, then there can be no local deterministic mode of description in the first frame of reference. So uh, again, if you allow superluminal observers, you have to forget about the deterministic mode of description even for massive objects. So spontaneous decays are inevitable even for regular matter if you allow uh, superluminal ob observers to, to be part of your family of inertial observers. Okay, let's, let's continue. Um, consider a frame of reference in which um, something very simple happens. Suppose that uh, there is a photon that is emitted at given point A. The photon refle is reflected from a mirror at M and then goes towards another point B. And we are observing this from a orthodox kosher subluminal frame of reference. Let's call this a resting frame of reference. So we just see a photon bounce from a mirror. If we now I'm going to say something very, very obvious. A photon can only be detected once. If I take a detector and place it on the path of the photon and the detector clicks, then if I place another detector further on the path, the other detector will not click. Which means that if I place one detector between A and M somewhere here, and it clicks, and I place another detector here between M and B, then this one cannot click. And vice versa. If the second detector clicked, then first one couldn't have clicked earlier because, well, the photon would be already absorbed. Now let's look at the same situation from the perspective of the infinitely fast moving observer again. So we have to apply this transformation, essentially rotating the diagram by 19 degrees. In this case, it appears that there is not a single photon, but there are two photons, one moving to the left, the other moving to the right. However, if you place two detectors on the two paths, between M and A and M and B, then only one detector will be able to click. If the first detector clicks, then the second one will not. If the second clicked, then the first one couldn't have clicked. So it looks like if you try to find, detect those particles, you will be only able to find them at one place at once. However, if you take away the detectors, the particle seems to be moving along two paths at the same time because there are two paths and none of them is preferred. So again, if you allow those crazy superluminal solutions mathematically allowed, if you allow them to your theory, then the motion along a single line uh, appears to be just, uh, um, well, some, 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 some impossibility, so to say, because you will always be able to find a frame in which your object will be moving along more than one path at the same time. So things that were surprising and shocking in quantum theory are a natural and very simple consequence of relativity when you only allow the mathematically allowed family of observers. And uh, you can uh, actually uh, iterate this concept. For example, if you have a particle moving from A to alpha and then scattered into some sort of a superposition where it moves along two paths at the same time, then for an observer moving infinitely fast, you will see the three parts pass at the same time and you can basically iterate this to have four paths, five paths, and as many paths as you want. Um, so eventually that leads you to asking a question, uh, would it be possible to consider a particle moving uh, along multiple paths at the same time? And how to describe such, such a motion? And uh, that brings us to the last point of, of, of this talk, where we want to show that the, actually this is possible to, to, uh, to describe. So, uh, such a motion, 
using relativity and you will, you will soon find that the using use of complex numbers is completely inevitable here and the exact formula for summing for computing probability is also inevitable so let us ask a question suppose you have this type of motion where particle moves between two points along multiple paths and you would like to find some sort of relativistic description of such motion well when you have a single path then the relativistically uh, invariant description involves something that is called proper time which is essentially an integral along the path from a to b with this lorentz factor and uh, mm, what, this is a relativistic invariant uh, what is less known is that this exact invariant is actually something that in quantum theory you call phase because this is up to a constant equal to energy times dt minus momentum times dx uh, integrated along the path with energy momentum given by the formulas, the standard uh, special relativistic formulas. This is essentially a product of four position and four momentum. So clearly it's a relativistic invariant. So for a single path, you would describe it uh, using this something, something I'm gonna call a phase phi, which is a proper time. For multiple paths, we will be looking for some sort of description uh, of, a, of a function that depends on phases along individual paths, uh, all of them at once. So. I'm gonna be looking for some function that characterizes uh, a diagram like this, that depends only on relativistic invariance. And since labeling of those um, of those paths is, is random, I mean, it's arbitrary, the function should not depend on the way I'm labeling the, the paths, which means that if I apply an arbitrary permutation of indices, the function should be exactly the same, which means that it has to be completely symmetric. So I'm gonna, so far I'm not even saying what this quantity P is. I'm just saying that any physical quantity characterizing uh, such motion in a relativistic fashion has to be of this form. Now, uh, whatever theory I'm gonna consider, I would like the theory to be time reversible. And in that case, it means that if I change time into minus time, uh, basically the expression should not change. And since phase is uh, flipping when I change time to minus time, then uh, that basically says that if I change all the signs of all the phases, the, the, the function P should not change. So it should be time symmetric one. And the last uh, assumption I'm gonna take about function P is, uh, is expressing the fact that what I'm looking for is some sort of probabilistic description. Uh, so I already know that I should not expect my theory to be completely deterministic. I should expect some uh, indeterminacy, which means that um, I should be looking at least for a probability of a given process. Not uh, I cannot say with anything with certainty. So I'd like my, my function P to have some properties, properties of probability. But the problem here is that uh, you don't really know what probability is because it has different properties in different theories. In, in quantum theory, probability is not additive. In classical theory, it is. So what, what do you call proper, what, what properties of probability should you consider? And uh, fortunately, there is only one prop property of probability that is universal and applies in all theories. And it's actually a defining, one of the defining properties of probability, which is uh, basically saying that if you have two independent events, one happening here, the other happening here, the first with probability P1, the other with probability P2, then the probability of the whole of both of them taking place is essentially a product of probabilities. And I'm gonna use this property as, a, as some sort of axiom here. So uh, for a special case of motion between two points that I'm considering in which the paths uh, cross at a single point in between A and B, I'm able to uh, apply this postulate and say that the probability characterizing the whole should be the probability for the first part times the probability for the second part, which formally can be written as, uh, as in the following equation, P of the first part times P of the second part has to be equal to P of the whole. And since phases are additive because they're integrals along paths, then uh, what I have to consider in the argument is sums of phases along uh, the, the individual paths. And that's all. And what is really surprising is that those three very, very general assumptions lead to a very few number of solutions. There's very few functions that satisfy all those three assumptions. And the special case is this. This is a special case of the solution of those three axioms, 
uh, it features three arbitrary constants, alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, you can show that the special solution has this form where you have to sum over all the paths with exponential functions and phases, then multiply by the same uh, structure, but with minus signs and take two arbitrary powers gamma and multiply by an arbitrary constant. I mean, uh, number of paths to an arbitrary power. And the general solution, it can be shown that the general solution of this problem is a product of special solutions like this. Which means that the most, the simplest solution that you can actually consider is this function that you have here. And that's the, essentially the simplest reasonable relativistic invariant characterizing motion along multiple paths. That has properties of, of probability. And um, the last thing you can observe is that if you allow not finite but infinite number of paths, which is something that you may be interested in, and if you if you'd like your your system your particle to be able to move along multiple infinite number of paths, and uh, then you run into the following problem: summing up infinite number of numbers larger than one has to be infinite. So if you'd like your your invariant to be finite, which is the last assumption, it has to be finite then there is only one thing that can secure uh, finiteness of, of your uh, relativistic invariant. And that's, uh, that property is that the number alpha that appears here, that is completely arbitrary, has to be purely imaginary. And in that case, you can sum up infinitely many complex numbers and still get a finite result. So to summarize, the only reasonable um, relativistic invariant that is time symmetric and has properties of pr probability and it's always finite or has a chance to be always finite has to be of the form that we know from the quantum theory where you have to sum up over all the paths with a phase attributed to every path that is a complex number and take a modulus square well actually you could take any power but square is the simplest one so um, you can make it a little bit more general but the, clearly the quantum mechanical description is the simplest that comes to mind, and there are not too, too many other choices. So to summarize, uh, um, I would conclude that if you allow uh, what uh, Galileo already discovered, that principle of relativity saying that all inertial observers are allowed and they are equally good to describe laws of physics and not restrict yourself to only subluminal observers, but allow the superluminal observers to um, take part, then first of all, you end up in a theory that is not necessarily paradoxical and self-inconsistent. Definitely, it doesn't have determinism and you get undeterministic behavior as a consequence. You can deduce it actually from principle of relativity. Second of all, you get inevitably um, a situation in which particles move along several paths at the same time. And third of all, uh, you get complex numbers and the uh, only reasonable relativistic description of such motion involves summing over all paths uh, with pay, like phase factors attributed to each of the paths. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. I'm happy to, to be executed with the questions. All right, thank you very much, Andre. great talk. All right, it's time for questions. Please uh, use the raise hand feature to ask questions. Okay, Jorma is the first question. Jorma, go ahead. Hello, Andrzej. Hello, Very, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Very uh, thought-provoking. Uh, so when you include these uh, transformations with V, mod V greater than one, you seem to be getting some generalization of the Lorentz group. Is, is there some well-known uh, description of this generalization in group theoretic terms? Yes, indeed. And uh, the generalization uh, strongly depends on the dimensionality of your space-time. For example, in the one plus one dimensional space-time, that is our favorite and the simplest one always, uh, you actually uh, see that the group of uh, transformations is basically Lorentz group times two. You have two disjoint subgroups and uh, you, you, can, you have a discrete transformation from one of them to the other. And there is the perfect physical symmetry between those groups. So in principle, in one plus one dimensional space time, you, you could be a tachyon 
Yorma and you even wouldn't know about it because there is simply no physical uh, discri discrimination between those groups. However, in, however, in one plus three dimensional space time, the situation gets much more interesting because it can be shown that the smallest group containing both subluminal and superluminal solutions is actually SL4R, uh, which is a group of all uh, linear transformations which clearly cannot be a symmetry group because it contains elements that are clearly not symmetries, such as stretching uh, uh, or uh, um, direction-dependent time dilation. These uh, operations are not symmetries. So um, while you can formulate a group containing both of those uh, transformations, th this is not going, going to be a symmetry group, which, how do you interpret it then? Well, you could send, you, 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 the, my conclusion is that in one plus three-dimensional space-time that we inhabit, you would, not, you would know that you are a tachyon if you were one. So there is a physical difference between superluminal observers and subluminal observers. Among all subluminal observers, there is perfect symmetry and you cannot discriminate between them. Also among all the superluminal symmetries, uh, observers, there is a perfect symmetry and you would know which tachyon you are, but uh, you would definitely know that you are a tachyon, not a subluminal object. So um, uh, that, that is it. And, um, uh, in this case, the uh, principle of uh, relativity needs to be somehow uh, loosened a little bit uh, to, to say basically that you can observe the same space-time from different points of view, but you would know that you are a superlinear object in one plus three dimensional space-time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jorma. Uh, any other questions? So, so I have one. I have one question. So that the, um, when you get, if if you uh, if you think that there could be some whatever spontaneous, some predictable process uh, that may be uh, meaningful to take a, a look at, even if it's a superluminal, those, those superluminal particles exist. They cannot. It's not just that you can't predict the mechanism, right? It just cannot contain any information whatsoever. Or they can't say in this region of space time there's copper and not here. If the thing that comes is made of copper, well, you have information. That shouldn't be allowed either, right? So is well, it, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, so so uh, yes, that, that's that's basically it. And uh, you can you can try to ask whether you can communicate with those particles right. in any way. And uh, I was challenging many people uh, trying to to find such a mechanism, and I was trying myself, and I, I'm not aware of any mechanism that would allow you to mm -hmm. to communicate, but. Essentially, you can you can reverse the question and ask uh, what of the of the properties of those particles are necessary in order not to run into problems with right. uh, causality, like in some sort of grandfather paradox. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't able to find a paradox, uh, even if you play around with those particles and try to uh, ask uh, in, um, difficult questions. They still always forbid you from from signaling, in a very similar fashion as quantum theory forbids you from signaling. Uh, you know, it, it's very um, well, well tailored so that it suits quantum theory very well. It's uh, uh, relativity and quantum theory are somehow very um, well together. They don't contradict each other, although it seems so, which which is a bit surprising. How is it possible that those two different theories know about each other so much? And um, well, the answer is they are not different theories. One follows from the other. That's at least in this in this formulation. All right. Well, thank you. Any more questions? Say any more hands? Sorry, I forgot to raise. Oh, please, uh, Albert. Albert, yes, go uh, ahead. Just, just send a follow-up also to what your question or your 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 comments, which it seems to me that uh, I guess it's something that one could really try to follow on. I mean, just you include these uh, relativistic particles in a standard treatment, or even at the level of quantum field theory, but allowing for tachyonic fields. And anyway, uh, one tries to describe that, but it seems that what must be happening is that. Whereas with standard fields and then standard quantum mechanics or kind of standard quantum mechanics, you find that you have something like, you know, through decoherence and so on, some kind of emergent classicality. Uh, it would seem to me that uh, if you try to do that in a theory where you have these kind of particles or even fields, tachyonic fields, presumably when you try to find uh, that, that uh, the usual 
emergent classicality that we have otherwise for sufficiently microscopic and you know, coupling to environments and so on in, 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 in the usual case that somehow here would not work completely, that you would never be able to uh, have approximately classical processes that uh, would involve in a non-trivial way these uh, tachyonic particles because otherwise you would then go back to the problem that you were trying to avoid when you uh, concluded that they, they had to be intrinsically indeterministic. I'm, I'm not sure whether... I, I think I sympathize with that claim. Uh, I think I, would, I tend to agree that uh, the world could not be... If we had those particles present, uh, probably they don't even exist, and that doesn't change anything about what I said, but if those particles existed, they could uh, lead to uh, emergence of uh, unpredictable behavior in the macroscopical scales. And the reason for that is uh, a bit subtle, I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, if you have a muon that decays into electrons and neutrinos, and normal massive particles, then the probability of the decay is uh, non-zero, and the moment of that decay is uh, random to some degree, and it takes place on time scales of the order of microseconds, say. However, if you wait one hour and you started with a single muon, the chance of the decay is practically 100%. Which means that in the microscopical scale, um, you have certainty that the decay took place. And uh, I mean, in those macroscopical scales, things seem to be deterministic, although it's really not on the microscopical scale. So it's a matter of the scales you are looking at the process. and. With tachyons, it's not that easy because you can actually show that if you have source of, of tachyons, then you, that source could emit infinitely many tachyons at a constant rate, and that would not be in conflict with preservation of energy because the properties of energy momentum uh, for a vector of a tachyon are slightly different. And it is allowed for a particle to emit a tachyon and just bounce off and only change, not even changing the mass, which means that the source of tachyons could emit, emit them all the time, and that would not allow you to conclude that in large timescales, certain process took place. You would have a constant rate of emission and um, that would not uh, be, uh, that would not have a classical limit. At least this is my understanding. So, so there is a, a, um, some sort of uh, uh, asymmetry between those solutions in one plus three dimensional space time. And uh, for that reason, you may be right that if those particles really existed and they were able to strongly interact with our matter, we may be able to witness that in the form of some sort of indeterminism in the macroscopical uh, reality. But now, since now you mentioned a point that might actually be important also, that um, uh, because my suggestion was if one wanted to explore this, in, and not just this, but in general, these tachyonic particles in more detail, you could try to, you know, you just consider quantum field theory and you yes. include the field where you by hand put, you know, that it has, uh, you know, the, 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 the negative square mass. Yes, that, then, has been done. That's, that has been done. Right. But then as you, I think, in, started to remind me, what you will find is, and that's maybe one of the reasons why you might end up concluding that maybe tachyons, well, that they are very problematic, is that you, you might end up finding all kinds of instabilities. Isn't that the case? That when, if you really try to play that game, you find all kinds of instabilities like those that you were, in a sense, already... Yeah, that, uh, is, that is exactly the case. So, so um, I spoke with Hol uh, Holger Nielsen many years ago, uh, guy who is a creator of string theory about mm. this, this idea. And uh, we, we were trying to find out uh, some sort of uh, loophole or some sort of problem with, with this, this formulation. And the only thing he could find is the, exactly the instabilities in the string theory when you consider tachyonic fields. So actually, a lot of efforts in the particle physics community uh, dealing with, especially with strings, is in order to get rid of superluminal solutions. And if you Google out tachyons in yes, physical yes. review D, you find hundreds of articles every month about how to get rid of tachyonic instabilities. And so they can kind of show up uh, and you want to get rid of them because they seem to be causing problems. Uh, so so uh, there could be some problems, but uh, clearly there is no evidence that I'm aware, aware of in a classical theory, especially in special relativity, that would a priori um, uh, make you discard those solutions as, as unphysical. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not familiar with any argument why those uh, solutions are unphysical or they lead to some uh, logical inconsistencies other than referring to advanced uh, uh, string theory that has some problems with stability well, of those but, solutions. I mean, I think that this, uh, the, the string theory, uh, the reference to string theory that maybe he referred to is because that's the context where, but the, the reasons why 
uh, one tries to avoid these tachyons in string theory, I believe it's just the reason why you would try to avoid them in, in, in other quantum field theory contexts. You don't need to focus on the most sophisticated uh, string theory. And some of these instabilities will arise, I believe, in any quantum field theory, even more you know, plain ones. Um, so, so the string theory part is not so crucial, I think. It's just that the, the sense in which generically you have these instabilities, and maybe you can even, and I'm not sure, I will need to think a bit about that, but you might even be able to put them up even in a classical sort of uh, field theory setting, similar to not, you know, like systems that would be radiating classical and put them in uh, without uh, violating energy conservation. I'm thinking now of a different context where you have for example, it's not the tachyonic case, but other cases where you have this kind of runaway, uh, runaway, like, like for example, systems where they have an inverted uh, Hamiltonian with uh, an opposite sign. And then if you couple them through some field, you can have this runaway solution where one of the subsystems gains energy and the other loses, and you have energy conservation, but you can have instabilities. That, that's not the tachyonic case, but maybe you can build up some, some examples with tachyons, even, even at the classical level, perhaps. I'm not sure, I will need to think about it. I, I kind of, I, I don't uh, rule out that possibility. This is clearly possible. But the, the, the point is, uh, what I'm making is the following one. You start with a classical theory, like special relativity, or even principle of Galilean principle of relativity. You build a framework of what is allowed, what is not allowed, and you find that there are these two families of solutions. You take them into account, you formulate your framework, and that already um, um, restricts possible theories to the ones that are not deterministic, that involve multiple paths, that involve complex numbers and certain way of computing probabilities. So you don't have to assume those things like, like Feynman did in his book, but this actually follows from relativity. And then you, you have some bounds on top of that, like some physical bounds, like the standard model that tells you, oh, this particle is possible, this particle is possible, but not that particle. For example, you have electron, you have muon, you have tau, but you don't have a particle that has a mass of two electrons for, for a reasons that nobody understands. And for, maybe for some reasons, those superlinear solutions do not exist, and maybe very well so, because otherwise we'd have some unstable universe. But uh, what I'm saying is that absence of tachyons in reality, first of all, uh, does not mean that we should discard the uh, superliminal point of view as a possible description of universe because that is just a simple property of pr principle of relativity. And uh, second of all, uh, well, we are not entirely sure if those objects do not exist. Uh, and it's unclear to say what, what would be the consequence if they existed. Maybe there will be an instability, so maybe we are lucky do they don't exist. But uh, honestly saying that doesn't change anything, a single word about what we have said because we were just looking at the consequences of special relativity. And those very general considerations lead you to believe that the quantum mechanical framework is uh, inevitable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so my comments did not mean to invalidate uh, the reasoning that you presented. It was more than since you, you know, really explored or, or, or uh, uh, you know, investigated in a lot of detail the consequences of these kinds of tachyonic particles and tachyonic fields somehow that, uh, Made me think a little bit more or, or refreshed uh, this question of okay, so what, what, why, what are the reasons why usually they are uh, maybe not? You know, one might think that uh, is there some physical reason why one would expect that uh, these tachyonic uh, particles would they give rise to some unphysical consequences beyond those that you discussed about the indeterminacy and so on. So, 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 uh, just, so just, just as a separate question, I mean, not a criticism to the reasoning that you use here, but just since the question of, you know, tachyonic particles and fields was brought up, you know, in, in by, by your talk, I was just wondering myself, you know, are there, do we have already some good reasons to argue that uh, tachyonic particles maybe should not exist in reality, uh, or at least what are the, would they give rise to some kind of uh, physical consequences beyond those that you consider more in the line of maybe? Yeah, I would, I would say that if such a reason exists, it has to be a, a sophisticated reason due to some quantum field theoretic consideration of stabilities uh, of, of some objects. But uh, I'm not aware of anything less sophisticated like on the level of a classical physics. Okay, anyway, as, as uh, uh, Jorma said, a very thought-provoking <laughs> talk, so thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you for the discussion, Albert, um, uh, Daniel Greer, Dan, go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. It was, was uh, very interesting, lots of thoughts. Um, 
Could, could you go back to the Feynman quote from the first slide? Yeah. Because I, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about what he's, what he's saying here. He's asking for um, what is the machinery behind the law, right? So in a sense, what I think he's asking for here is a constructive explanation for why quantum theory is the way it is rather than say some principled explanation. And, and I, I don't know, I'd, I'd really love to see some of these details that Albert was, was putting out about how exactly are you going to model these uh, tachyonic particles and how are they supposed to do the sort of work that they want to do? Because they, they do have to interact with the particles in certain ways and cause them to behave. So there has to be some uh, level of contact between the two worlds, the superluminal one and the, and the regular one. Right, uh, right. So, I, so I, I'd like to see more details on on the the actual machinery, like Feynman asked for. Yeah. So I would say that principle of relativity is a very highly underestimated assumption. Uh, to my understanding, principle of relativity is extremely strong physical law. For example, I have for a reason we are deriving special relativity only from principle of relativity, because you already can. That that always gives you an idea how strong that assumption is and we don't really know why is it possible to move through this medium that the space-time is with a constant speed and not even notice it like any other substance if you move through it you will feel it but you, you can move through that substance of space-time and you don't feel so that's some sort of very strong assumption about physics of that medium um, and uh, apparently uh, well this is I, I don't know if you can call it a mechanism but a property of reality that that is that that you can move with constant speed and not change anything that um, innocent assumption seems to be already strong enough to, 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 to reach very strong conclusions. Um, and in a way, what we are doing is formulating some sort of impossibility um, constraints, like you cannot have deterministic description, you cannot have motion along a single path. Uh, now, what all that you're left with is, uh, is very restricted. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you anything more than this, and I would love to, but uh, going back to Feynman's quote, Feynman's quote, he said that we have no ideas about the basic mechanism. Well, we do in a way. The mechanism is principle of relativity and whatever space-time is on a very granular level, a microscopical, like maybe Planckian level, at least in our scales, it feels like uh, there is no friction as you move along with a constant velocity. So it's some, it's, it's some, some, some sort of tells you a little bit of, about the machinery of space-time. And um, in this uh, in this way, you, I would argue that yes, this is some 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 basic mechanism uh, that that is responsible for all these things. Right. Um, yeah, I, I agree. The principle is very strong, and that you can get quite a lot from it. But it is it is sort of just a principle. And if you want to answer the question, what is the machinery behind the law? We can we can identify systematic behaviors that the machinery has, and all the consequences that follow from that. But, a deeper question of what is the machinery. And I, I'm, I'm studying philosophy now, by the way, so I've sort of jumped over. So maybe that's why I'm interested in these questions now. But um, Yeah, but I mean, in a way, you, uh, so, so you, you can see that those constraints even lead you to this, like uh, quite complicated expressions, and there is not much room of choice that you have for other. And all you need is, is principle of relativity again, and you arrive at those, those expressions. So, and they are very familiar from, from the quantum theory. So, Yes, indeed, it's a strong uh, um, mechanism, and saying that there is nothing more that can be said about uh, about the single quantum events is uh, maybe 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 that that you cannot say anything more because there is nothing more to say. Maybe 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 the idea that things have causes is just a superstition, and that's it, and you just have to forget about it, forget about it. Well, so this this, this brings to another point. Um, the the, say the decay of the massive atom into two other atoms. Now, if this is supposed to be caused by some tachyonic particle coming in and instigating that or something, but the, the exact time of that decay certainly can't be predicted. Um, but the, the rate of it over time, there's some systematic structure that depends on the mass and the other things. So somehow, yes. if these tachyonic particles are supposed to come in here and you're supposed to provide some model or some machinery to describe how this works, they have to be sensitive somehow to the masses of the particles and their speeds and lots of other things. So there, there has to be some much more description of what is this mechanism of how the tachyonic fields are and how they interact with these things and how it all comes to be that they end up uh, in a constructive way. So first say what they are and what the properties are and then build just from that, that they do satisfy these principles that you've right, derived. Right. 
Right. So first, first of all, um, I, w w the reason I said that the massive particles decay in a spontaneous way is not because they are triggered by a tachyon coming in. I didn't say that. I said that if you look at the regular decay like this, this decay from a perspective of a superlinear observer looks like one that involves only tachyons. And right. as such, right. we already know it cannot be deterministic. So, so if in one frame there is no mechanism behind the decay, there cannot be a mechanism behind the decay here. That was the argument. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, going back to your second question, you were saying about the properties of particles. And that is actually true. For example, when you derive special relativity, I said that there is, look at this equation, there you can actually show by uh, looking at composing free, free operations that there must be some constant, K, that you don't know what it is, that characterizes your space-time proper, properties of the space-time. And that constant phenomenologically appears to be one over C squared. Uh, that's one constant that appears. For, for, for the same reason, uh, uh, here in this derivation, I said that this, this dimensionless number phi, it has to be dimensionless because looking at functions of those parameters, this dimensionless number has to be proportional to e times dt minus p times dx. But there must be some proportionality constant. And you have no idea what the number is. Uh, when you make a measurement, turns out the number is one over h bar. And you don't know why, and you don't know what the value of that h bar thing. And uh, you, I, nobody has an idea how to derive the number. But those considerations already lead you to believe that there must be some uh, parameters characterizing your, uh, your, your, your functions that you have to take from experiment. At least uh, there is no other idea how to do it. So, uh, uh, and you, you can look at those, uh, uh, those, those expressions like this one, and there are these constants alpha and, and gamma and beta. And in principle, well, beta and gamma, you can try to, to guess, but alpha is completely arbitrary. And in principle can be different for different types of particles. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, these are your phenomenological numbers you want to plug in your theory. And uh, these obviously we cannot, and nobody can uh, derive. All right, thank you. That answers my question. All right, thank you very much. Great discussions. Uh, any more questions? Well, if there are any more questions, let's thank Andre again. Andre, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, talk of the session. Let's thank again all the speakers. Thank you very much for all the talks. And then uh, remember that we'll see each other again next week at the same time for uh, for the last session. Uh, the last session has um, uh, uh, same as this one, slightly more duration. And we don't have a particularly, we don't have, it doesn't start with an invited speaker, it starts with contributed talks. I will hopefully see you for the closure. There will be some try to an attempt to close the conference and see how that goes. And uh, again, yeah, one more session to go. Thank you very much for your attendance. See you next week.